this. Well, hey, good morning everybody and um, welcome to the 38th uh, meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, some members will be attending this morning's meeting via video conference and our witnesses for today's briefing will also be attending via video conference. We could just ask all members to, to mute our, and our witnesses as well. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web page on the Assembly website and just to remind members to mute their tablet devices if they're in the room. Um, apologies, uh, we have no apologies but we're expecting John John's Stirl Stirl to be later. Sure, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so moving on then to item number two which is chairperson's business um, and I just wanted to pick up this morning on the, the new COVID restrictions business support scheme which opened um, last week. There are, are some items in your pack and uh, which refer to that. At page 33 there's a press release from the Minister um, about the, the announcement of that. Um, that applications are open for first stage. Page 55, there's correspondence from excluded NI on the new scheme. Um, just ask members to, to note those unless there are any comments that they, they wish to add to that. Um, moving on then to 514, which is page 57 of your pack, which is guidance and, and FAQ to the Micro Business Hardship Fund. Um, and then page 297 of your pack, there's correspondence from the Minister on an update regarding the COVID restrictions business support scheme. The Minister has addressed some of the comments and advice from committee members regarding the applications for the scheme from a correspondence sent by the committee to the Minister on the 29th of October. And then at page 366 of your pack, there is correspondence from excluded NI about the issues and concerns arising from the, um, the CRBSS. Um, so, I, I know that I certainly have been contacted by some people in relation to the complexity of the application um, and it's something I had raised with the Minister and Permanent Secretary um, and they have said that they will endeavour to go the, the process um, it goes smoothly in terms of getting those grants out. Um, I just thought it was something that maybe the, the committee would like to um, have some comment on as well. Can we go with your daughter? Yes, Chair. Um, okay. number, many of us will have been contacted about the potential complexity of the Part A scheme. Uh, but it is what it is. It is there and people have to work through it. Um, but I think what we need to be doing now is the Minister's indicated there will be a Part B scheme and we need to know when that is going to be rolled out and will there be any lessons learned from the complexity or potential complexity of the Part A scheme. So if we could write urgently to the Minister to inquire about the Part B scheme. Thank you. Yes, Chair, I think we would concur with that generally. I think the important thing is that you know there is a process people have to work through <clears throat> And uh, we appreciate it. It can be taxing, but it's important that people do take some time and, uh, and process it. We all have to do it in, in, in various applications that we make, and we're all very much aware that the need has to be there for accountability and traceability. So we appreciate that you know people are concerned about the length of time it takes, but uh, you know we we have lobbied hard for this, and we want to make sure that it that the system is robust as well and, and fit for purpose. But uh, just on the, the ever uh, and never ending issue about those that, that are, are ex have been excluded or claim to be excluded, do you feel that the, the new um, grant schemes will cover a lot of those people or will catch those people or at least give them the opportunity to apply? Um, I think there were. Some of them, yeah. Um, I think there were some concerns around the, the need to be trading up to the 16th of October in terms of the application for the Part A. Um, so that's maybe something we can seek some clarity around as well. Um, yeah. And I, I, we obviously um, accept your point, Gordon, that there does need to be um, you know, a robustness around the application process. And I think if people are um, reassured that efforts will be made to get the, the funding out as quickly as possible once the, the applications have been received and processed, then I think that that offers a little bit of, of reassurance um, and hopefully that, that will be the case. The other thing is for people to seek advice, yeah. even through our offices or whatever, if, if they're in difficulty. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I, I guess just to pick up then on the newly self-employed scheme that was also announced, 
um, if there's a time frame for yeah. when we can expect that to be um, up and running as well, because obviously it's one that we have been, as a committee, pushing for for many months as well. Members? Follow through. Another point, Chair, just on it. Invest NI are managing these schemes, isn't that right? What about a contact for us with Invest NI? I know, I suppose, we indirectly we have some that we, <laughs> we have historically, but perhaps an up to date contact would be useful for us. I'll source that. For Please. Yeah, I can think of a few people already, it'd be, it'd be useful. Uh, Chair? I go ahead. Thank um, uh, no, there, there was a number of questions as well that was raised with the finance minister in relation to um, the, the, the furlough scheme. Maybe that's not what we're talking about at this stage. And he was to come back and get detail in relation to those who were uh, newly employed after the first uh, furlough deadline, which I think was the end of the June, he had said. Um, it would be good if we could maybe put the, the committee weight behind getting those answers and details too. And, and I know he is seeking to do that. Um, I, I'm getting a lot of correspondence from constituents in relation to, um, you know, they've maybe only been employed since the summer. Um, and will they be eligible? And, you know, um, if, if they weren't originally on their on the original furlough scheme, will it be backdated? Because Northern Ireland has gone into um, its own closures before that was announced. So will they get it for the two weeks um, that has already that's already happened? Um, so, so, so it would be useful to get those questions. Um, in relation to the, the new hardship scheme, I, I don't know if other members are, are getting any feedback on this, but are, are we aware if any of the monies has actually gone into people's accounts yet? Um, you know, and when could we expect that? I think that might be a useful question because, again, I'm, I'm, you know, what we're two, nearly three weeks into into our um, closure scheme, so, um, you know, that I, I think it's urgent to get that on the ground as soon as possible. Um, just my understanding of the furlough scheme is it's for people employed up to the end of October, and I think there was some clarification yesterday about those who have been made redundant in anticipation of the furlough scheme ending yeah. that they would now be able to be rehired if their employer was willing to do that. Um, now that yeah. that came from the, the, um, the British Chancellor so mm. um, it would just be useful to get that clarification as well yeah. just to give oh, yeah. that extra reassurance. Um, but I the point that I, I would make around that is um, they said something about if your details were previously on it from an, the original furlough scheme and I have a situation where constituents may have only got employed in you know, end of September, mm. so they wouldn't have been eligible because they, they were working. Um, so, you know, can we ensure that anyone, you know, who was employed up until the 31st of October, despite their start date, um, will be eligible for that and that backdated bit? I think that's the key that people are looking for. Are they going to get, you know, the 80% for the two weeks that have already happened? Sure, we can follow up on sure. all that. Yes, um, sure, can I come in? Yep. Chair, uh, yes. I, I wonder, is it too late um, for Invest NI or the department to review the complexity of Part A of the form, um, or Part A of the the the, uh, the the new form or the new um, application process? And also, it's really important um, that we get the, the the second monies out. I realise that um, it's two weeks. Um, that we have um, been in this lockdown, but it's actually four weeks in Derry, and people actually have had no money for um, the greater part of those four weeks. So we really, really need to kind of step up and get that money out as soon as possible. Chair, we'll follow up on that as well. Um, I, I don't think it's impossible to... to at least clarify the criteria. I know previously that's been yeah. able to be done. Um, and there was some clarifications yeah. offered by the department last week yeah. in relation to on some of the queries. And all yeah. Yeah. So we, we press on that, Chair. No problem. Um, and just an additional point, um, and it has been raised by other members as well, in relation to the banks that we had said yeah. that we a few weeks ago that we wanted to get some feedback from the banks around um, the... the I suppose support that they were offering to customers, both individuals and businesses, at this time, um, and there have been further, I suppose, announcements and of um, the the impact that COVID has had on on the banking sector over the last while as well, um, in the past week or so. So I think that it would just be useful to get that feedback. Chair, sure, we we got a we wrote to all the the local banks, but they replied collectively under their um, membership organisation. And it was at that stage. It was about um, the issue around people not being able to get new loans and so mm. on. So, if members are going to write again, 
um, about the latest issues that have come up. Chair, Chair there is a, a, an apology, this probably should be on the other business, but because we're discussing banks, there is a very serious issue, both right across the UK and specifically here in Northern Ireland, because I've been, in, I've been in correspondence with the banks. They are currently not opening business accounts. Um, and yes, it was. One bank replied to me saying that customers who were using their personal banking accounts for business uh, would be first in the queue, uh, which is fair enough if you bank with a bank and you have a, a, a and you have a track record with them. But to but but many of these schemes require identification of a business bank account, and it, it seems unforgivable that the banks cannot or, or are not processing business bank accounts at the moment. Yeah, I think it was a particular issue with the bounce back loan application. Yes, yeah. as well. Flag that. Thank you, well. Chair. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members, unless there's anything else that anyone wants to add. Okay, okay. Okay, so moving on then to um, item number three, which is our draft minutes. Um, there is a copy of the minutes from the meeting held on the 21st of October at page six of your packs. Um, are members content that this is an <coughs> accurate reflection of the meeting? Agreed. And then at 3.2, there's a copy of the draft record of decisions from the meeting held at, on the 21st of October. Members will recall that we had to leave the room a little bit early that day. Um, so are members content that the record of decisions is an accurate reflection? Yes, great. Thank you. So moving on then to item number four, which is our briefing from the department on the um, audit office report on the NIRO. There is a clerk's memo at page 17 of your pack. There's a departmental briefing uh, on the NIRO um, at page 20 of your packs, and then there's the renewable NI response to the NI audit office NIRO report at page 26 of the pack. Um, at page 48, there is a memo from the Public Accounts Committee regarding the NIO, NIAO audit re report on renewables. The PAC agreed at its meeting on the 22nd of October to hold an inquiry into the report. However, the date for that is yet to be confirmed. So the, um, uh, the PAC have um, reminded us of their right to primacy on the issue, and <coughs> that means the committee will have to step away from it, basically following this briefing today. So, Peter, is there anything you want to add to that? No, Chair, it's just um, members will be familiar with PAC's right to primacy. Once they've announced they're going to do a, an inquiry into an issue, we step back, let them do their inquiry, and then if there are issues that the committee can pick up after that, we come back in again and do that. But essentially, after today's briefing, PAC will take over. Thank you. Um, so Chair, before, yeah, you, before you move on, could I just raise an issue? I, I was contacted. It, it, it relates to our previous... Uh, matter in, in relation to the help that's available for people. I have a, I've been contacted by someone who said basically they're a self-employed insurance broker for life cover and because of the present restrictions they can't go door to door yeah. to meet their clients and because they're self-employed and because they can't go door to door they're yeah. in serious trouble. I'm just wondering could we get some clarity from the department there in, in relation to what help is available for someone in that position. I imagine, I imagine he's not the only one. No, exactly. Sorry to interrupt you, no, Chair. No <laughs> Thank you. Okay, then, so um, I'd like to welcome to our meeting this morning uh, Richard Rogers, who's Head of Energy Division, and Thomas Byrne, who's Director of, of the Sustainable Energy Division, and Trevor McBriar, who Grade 7 SEM Renewables Branch. So if I hand over to yourself, Richard, to make an opening statement, and then we'll open up to, to members for questions. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, we're, we're here, obviously, to discuss the Audit Office's report into generating electricity from renewable energy. Quick bit of background, and then I'm, I'm going to actually hand over to Thomas to, to, to provide the quick overview before we take uh, questions. Um, my background, as most of you will be aware, we've been here before, uh, 32 years now working in energy and natural gas and fuel poverty here and other parts of the world and for the last six and a half years in the, in the public sector. Thomas, as you mentioned, is our director of energy strategy in the department and Thomas is working on the development of the new energy strategy and also has been working for the past two years uh, on the, on the NIRO uh, engagement with the utility regulator and, uh, and Ofgem in terms of the, the audit office's investigation into the narrow. Um, Trevor McBriar um, has been in the civil service for 42 years. I think that's uh, several life sentences. 
and uh, for the past four years, Trevor has been um, um, involved in the detail of the delivery of NARO. And hopefully, between the three of us, we can answer most of the of the uh, committee's questions. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Thomas to say a few words before we we hear the questions. Thanks very much, Richard, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I have to start with an apology for, for technical reasons. My Starleaf has defaulted to the camera on my laptop that faces the wall instead of faces me, so I've had to put it uh, on the blank. Um, so apologies for that. Um, so very happy to be here this morning to provide briefing to the committee on the Northern Ireland Auto Office report on generating electricity from, from renewable energy. The Northern Ireland Renewables Obligation, the NARO, has been the main support mechanism to bring forward investment in renewable electricity in Northern Ireland, and the Department is responsible for the policy and legislation around this. Uh, we should start this session by saying that the Auto Office report recognises that the NARO has been a success. The Executive sets challenges and targets around renewable electricity, and the NARO has been the cornerstone of ensuring that these have been achieved. The most recent target was to meet 40% of electricity consumption from Indigenous renewable sources by 2020, and the NARO has helped us to meet and exceed this with the latest figure at 48%. We are now one of the market leaders in renewable electricity production across Europe, and this is an achievement to be proud of, and we've achieved this in a cost-effective way for local consumers. But the NARO is much more than just a cost to consumers and income stream for generators, and it should be acknowledged the many benefits that it has brought. So the NARO is a substantial part of how we are tackling climate change in Northern Ireland. When it was introduced in 2005, 97% of our electricity came from fossil fuels. With almost half of our electricity consumption now from renewables in 2020, power sector emissions have fallen substantially, and, and this has contributed over 50% of Northern Ireland's overall emissions reduction since 2005. The Audit Office report recognises that the NARO has delivered cleaner air and a reduction of our impact on the greenhouse effect. The NARO is also how we've kept wholesale electricity prices lower than they otherwise would have been. There is a direct cost to consumers of supporting renewable generation, but there's also a real benefit on wholesale prices, which the Audit Office report recognises. Put simply, when the wind is high, electricity prices are low. The NARO is how we've weaned ourselves off imported fossil fuels. Every kilowatt hour of electricity generated by NARO accredited stations is a kilowatt hour not being met from imported coal or gas. Our renewable generators are net exporters across the UK, estimated by the Audit Office to be worth £191 million in 2017-18. This is real income, providing a significant boost to the Northern Ireland economy, rather than being spent on purchasing fossil fuels from South America, Russia, the Middle East or elsewhere. The narrow side we've helped to support regional balance and rural diversification, two priorities of the executive. Our renewable electricity generators are, are in the northwest, they're in Oman Fermanagh, they're in Causeway Coast and Glens, and elsewhere across Northern Ireland. These are rural generators supporting rural economies and helping to diversify our farms. And indeed, the assets that we have as a result of the narrow will be vital to achieving our future ambition around energy strategy. So because of the indigenous renewable base we now have, we can look at ways to electrify heating and transport. We can look at ways to produce hydrogen and biogas for similar purposes. We now have options to replace fossil fuels across the energy system that we otherwise wouldn't have. Now, the Audit Office report focuses mainly on three technologies supported by the narrow, small-scale wind and biogas fuel stations from anaerobic digestion. So these technologies represent the minority of the narrow, about 12% of, of total capacity. But there's still an important part of the benefits that I've just described. We cannot just rely on large-scale wind for all our needs, and we need a diverse mix of indigenous renewable electricity sources. This is why the narrow and indeed renewable electricity support schemes in place elsewhere over the same period all supported these exact same technologies. Now, there are strategic questions raised by the Auto Office report. What is the role of small-scale renewables in a zero-carbon energy mix? What role can biogas and other farm-based technologies play in meeting net zero emissions? And how do we bring forward future investments in a way that minimizes any potential impacts, similar to some of the specific examples highlighted by the Audit Office? Now, these are important questions, and one that we need to consider as we develop future policy. Our Minister has been clear that she believes any future renewable electricity target should be no lower than 70% by 2030, and depending on the electricity needs for transport and heating, we may need to more than double our installed renewable capacity. And yet we sit here today without having had any support to bring forward new investment for over three years. We're the only part of the UK or Ireland that doesn't have a government-backed route to market for renewables. So we in the Department for the Economy are progressing this as a matter of urgency in the development of a new energy strategy. 
This will be the basis of delivering clean energy, displacing fossil fuels and building indigenous assets to generate income and support jobs, but done so in a way that learns from what has happened in the past. For a scheme as complex and far-reaching as the NARO, which ran for 12 years and accredited almost 24,000 generators, it is natural for any review to leave us with recommendations to follow up on. The order of support includes six recommendations, of which three are specifically for the Department for the Economy. We've accepted these recommendations and we will address them in the context of any future support that may be put in place. So, in conclusion, we agree with the Audit Office's finding that the NARO has been a success. I've reinforced many of the benefits that the NARO has delivered, and we have accepted that there are, of course, things that can need to be considered in any future support scheme. So I hope this has been a useful introduction to set the context for the session, uh, and, and the three of us are very happy to answer any questions or provide further information or clarification that we can. And thank you very much for that, Thomas. Um, and I think we, we do recognise the success that there has been in um, achieving the renewable electricity target and exceeding it. And also welcome the fact that there has now been a target set for, for 2030 of at least 70%. Um, I, I guess it, to pick up on some of the points that are, are in the um, audit office report um, and some of the concerns that I suppose have been expressed about uh, the NIRO in particular in relation to small scale wind and anaerobic digestion. In the 2010 and 11 call for evidence and consultation um, that set those bands, um, the, the rocks for those bands, can you maybe outline for us why the, the increase was set for the rocks at that time? Yeah, yes, of course, happy to. So I suppose I'll take small scale wind first, if that's OK. Um, so the feed in tariff in Great Britain was introduced to support small scale renewables at the time uh, in 2010, and it carried out a piece of work to gather information on technology costs and the level of support that was needed to bring forward investment in that. Um, so the feed-in tariff was introduced and the NARO used the evidence gathered for the feed-in tariff to set a rock level of four rocks uh, in Northern Ireland in April 2010. Um, it should be noted that this was actually still below the support that was put in place in the feed-in tariff, but it used a consistent evidence base across the UK to set that rock level uh, at four for small-scale wind in 2010. Um, for anaerobic digestion, and, and really it's, it's not the digesters that are supported by the NARO, it's the biogas that the digesters produce, which can be then be used for, for electricity production. Um, back in 2010, there was, there was a support level of two rocks for anaerobic digestion. Now, this was significantly below the support that was available under the FIT in Great Britain, and there was no commercial anaerobic digestion biogas in Northern Ireland, um, so it, it clearly wasn't successful at bringing forward uh, projects. So there was a call for evidence carried out, which received 20 responses from academia, developers in the industry, which provided actual information on the costs facing uh, biogas production, as well as international best practice drawn from countries like Germany and Sweden that had been successful in this area. But off the back of the information received on that, there was analysis and modelling carried out to estimate the level of rocks needed across a range of rates of returns. And this resulted in, in, a, in a rate of four rocks for stations up to 500 kilowatts and three rocks above that. So essentially, both it was based on evidence on technology costs and what the level of support was that was needed to bring forward the investment. Okay, thank you for that, Thomas. Um, and I guess just in the report, it says that it notes that much of the theoretical evidence came from organisations which did benefit financially from the increase in the level of support. And it goes on to say it's unclear from the evidence presented to us what level of due diligence was conducted by DETI to confirm the accuracy and independence of the in, um, information. Um, how, how would you respond to, to that? So, so what, I, what I would say, I guess, is that evidence was received from, from a range of different providers. Um, we had evidence, for example, from Queen's University, uh, who had the only research anaerobic digester in Northern Ireland. We received evidence from, of course, developers in the industry who knew the cost firsthand, and we received evidence from international best practice as well. And so what the department did was it didn't rely on any one in particular. It used on the range of evidence provided to then come up with the rates. So there wasn't any specific focus on one group or one, or one aspect. It was across the entire range of evidence provided that was used to, to result in those rates. Um, and the report also says that it's not clear why Daddy didn't include an additional band um, at that lower end um, and reduce the level of rocks after a 10 year period, which was one of the things that was suggested by one of the, um, I suppose, academics uh, submissions from, from AFPI. Um, 
is there a, a reasoning for that in terms of the analysis that was done um, by by Jetty? <sighs> So, so the rate that was put in place was for zero to 500 kilowatts, and this was consistent with the, the, the rate uh, banding that was put in place in the feed-in tariff. So by doing that, it meant a consistent, um, a consistent rate was put in place across the UK in terms of the scale of, of capacity that was accredited. Um, in terms of the nature of support, so the narrow provides support for 20 years and it's guaranteed for that. So there wasn't a mechanism with which to reduce support after a 10 year period. The, the support levels that were provided um, were, were done on a basis of, of ensuring a reasonable rate of return across the 20 years rather than focusing just on 10. Okay, so you know, the report also makes um, mention of the fact that there wasn't a further review of the, the rocks um, after 2010-11. Uh, um, is that something that in hindsight should have been done and in relation to that level that was put in place for the 20 year period, should a, you know, in hindsight should a review have been put in place? So there was actually a review of, of support for small scale uh, renewable electricity in Northern Ireland in 2014. Um, there was a piece of work carried out to review technology cost changes from when the original rates were set. And this found that the technology costs hadn't changed material for, materially for AD produced biogas since then. And so using that evidence, the department maintained the level of support at four rocks and three rocks because the evidence didn't suggest that the costs had changed since then. One of the other things the report mentions as well is that there was a perceived higher cost in terms of capital and connection to the grid that perhaps wasn't actually reality in terms of what the um, utility regulator responded. Um, is that something that was taken account of in terms of setting the, the, um, the bans? So, so the, the, the bands that would have been set would have been done on the basis of what the connection costs and other costs would have been in Northern Ireland, rather than looking at how they were relative to, across the rest of the UK. And, and I think that's probably the important thing is that when, when the rates were set, they looked at what, what would it cost to set up uh, biogas production in Northern Ireland, what are the costs that would be faced and what were the revenue streams that would be needed for that. Um, so it wasn't done relative to what the cost might have been in Great Britain, it was done to what the costs actually would have been here in Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, I, I guess just I suppose in terms of where we are now um, and the, the difficulties that there have been in particular with, with small scale um, renewable schemes um, and the need to, to I suppose repair the reputation, how do you as a department and as a division within the department um, take that on board and try to reassure the public that these very necessary schemes that are going to be required as part of the energy strategy to meet our um, renewable targets and our, our decarbonisation targets, that there is going to be the, the, the checks and balances and the, the proper um, controls in there to ensure that there, you know, there isn't repeats of um, you know, the mistakes that have been made in relation to some of these previous schemes. Yes, of course. Um, and I suppose a couple of things I would say to that. Um, firstly, any support schemes that are put in place now for renewable electricity generation are very different than something like the narrow that would have been in place back then. They tend to be uh, market-based capacity auctions, um, which, which procure renewable capacity for, for a market rather than a support scheme like the narrow or a tariff. So they work very, very differently and they don't actually guarantee any any revenue for generators what they do is they, they essentially provide a, a a price at which it gives them certainty over the period that if, if the price they get the post deal market falls below that that they actually can then get that topped up but they don't get any support if, if it's above that so it's about revenue stability rather than about support to the schemes that tend to be set up now what i would say is regardless of whatever schemes are come up with and whatever policies it's the work through the energy strategy that will deliver that and, and we've taken a collaborative approach to do that. So in anything we're looking at, for example, on the power side of things, we have brought together the relevant departments, we've brought together key players in uh, the electricity sector to make sure that any policies we come up with are evidence-based, are robust, and, and are developed in collaboration. Okay, um, and just uh, finally from me before I hand over to some other members, um, the specific DFE recommendations of this report um, have those begun to be implemented or has have you know they some of them already been implemented as part of the RHI inquiry report recommendations? Is there progress in relation to those? 
So of the six recommendations in the report, three are specifically for the department, and they mainly, they mainly relate to any future support that's put in place as opposed to, to things in the past. What I would say is one of them in particular is around joined up government, and I think this has already been addressed through the energy strategy where we've brought together every government department as part of the government stakeholders group or as part of wider work. Uh, with, with them. We've, we've brought central and local government into the working groups that we're working on. So we've already tried to take on board that point in developing future policy and future strategy. And we've accepted the others as well. And, and as I say, in the context of future support that we're developing, we'll make sure that they're addressed. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and maybe come back with some further ones. Um, Stuart. Thank you, Chair, and appreciate um, your attendance to the committee this morning and the information that you've given us. Um, can I ask you uh, just a number of brief questions in terms of the audit report and the issues that are contained in it? Going forward, how can the department and particularly your area of operation avoid the expensive mistakes of the past? And secondly, going on from that, the reality is the Department of the Economy is a very large department covering a wide diversity of areas of responsibility. In reality, given the importance of energy and energy strategies, does Northern Ireland need a Department of Energy um, to actually deliver uh, the ambitious programmes that are really required uh, to keep us moving forward? Um, and finally, why do we not have, and is there any move to have an independent advisory body to promote sustainable energy? Okay, well, thank you very much for, for those questions. Um, we're looking to the future, we're looking to develop policy, and we're looking to do it right. And so what we have done is we put a real focus on evidence as part of the development of the future energy strategy. Uh, you'll be aware that a call for evidence was carried out in December uh, 2019. And on top of that, then we've, we formed a number of various different working groups that bring together um, all the various different stakeholders needs to those areas to provide evidence in terms of what the future policy may be. So our focus is on collaboration. It's in working with people together and it's on the evidence that they can provide to make sure that the, policy, the policies of the future are cost effective in meeting our ambitions. Um, and I think this is this is where the department is now showing clear leadership in this area because we are bringing together players across government, across the private sector, and across the wider stakeholder groups to look at future policy and to help inform them. Um, one Thomas, thing I was mentioning, sorry, sorry, Richard. Thomas, if, I, if I could just quickly come in on the question on the Department for uh, of Energy. Um, it, it's our analysis at this time that a Department for Energy wouldn't solve the problem. I mean, we all know how the government is organized in Northern Ireland. It's not like across the water in GB. Every department is, has its own responsibility, um, and its own accounting officer and its own minister. If we were to create a department of, for energy, we would still have the issue, for example, in transport of a modal shift that would belong in the transport department, the department for infrastructure. We'd still have the, the rural the rural issues, the, the agriculture that would be in DERA. Um, so actually, it's, it's, it depends on how you cut and slice this. And actually, our approach over the past year and a half in the development of the energy strategy has been about a proper through collaboration across government for each department takes its own responsibility to put together the jigsaw that will get us to, to an answer. So um, Department for Energies have been tried across the world. There was DEC in, uh, in, in the UK and, and then there wasn't DEC, um, Department for Energy and Climate. So, so our, our analysis in this at the moment is that we work, we should work well with what we've got. Um, Thomas, maybe if you could pick up the question about the independent advisory body. But do you not mean that you either get diluted or lost in a very large economy department? And in reality, and this is not particularly a defence of the minister, but it is very difficult for one minister to cover all of these topics. It's a, it's a really good point, and I, and, and I think looking back uh, to privatisation in the mid-90s, um, there was a small team in the department, um, and uh, yes, it might be it might be argued that there wasn't enough investment in energy in the department, uh, you know, for some time. 
But we've taken steps to address that. We've got a very significant energy group within the department. It's one of uh, five key, key core groups in the department for the department for the economy. Um, energy is going to be really important for the future economy, economic development in Northern Ireland. It's all about a green economic recovery. And so I feel that now that the new structure we have in, in the department, that we've got, a, we've got a, an excellent way forward. And most importantly, we are now working very closely with departments across government to actually ensure that the, 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 the economic development we have is green and is sustainable and will reduce greenhouse gas emissions in an affordable way. Richard, if I could maybe just come in there as well, and um, I suppose one of the things from the RHI report was the, the lack of specialists within yeah. divisions, um, and you, you outlined your own um, history in terms of, of energy. Um, is that is there others within the department that also have specialism, or sorry, within the division that also have um, similar specialism? Yes, and, and you know, it's... It's something that we learned clearly from from the RHI. It's, it's making sure that we have the expertise and the capacity. Um, so, for example, we we just run a, a competition for um, DP DPs within Energy Group. Um, we had uh, we had forty nine applications. It was external and internal to the civil service. It's been a fantastic response, and we look to bring people who have got experience. Uh, from outside, as well as people who have got the relevant experience from inside the civil service. So we, we worked very hard at building the capacity over the past three years. And now we have a, a lot more specialists as well as people like Trevor, who, who's 42 years experience in the civil service, bring stuff that people like myself, who, who are relatively new, don't, don't quite understand about the system. Thanks for that, Richard. Thank you, Chair. If I would hand back to Thomas then to... The final part of the question, um, one of the things through the call for evidence that was raised was the, the desire for something similar to a sustainable energy authority to act as, as an external body that can really drive forward our clean energy ambitions and act as a, as a one-stop shop, if you will, um, for consumers, for the industry and for, for driving forward some of the support programs. So that's something that we are actually looking at through the development of the energy strategy is best practice um, from, from across the UK and Europe on sustainable energy authorities and how something like that might play a role in Northern Ireland. Just chair to say that's a very welcome comment from the department. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it was one of the things that's featured in the our own um, micro inquiry as well. Um, thank you. John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, audit office reports can be a very bruising experience uh, for civil servants and ministers. <coughs> I have an experience of it from both sides. I was a minister who was the subject of an audit office report. And I also used to be chair of the PAC, so I have certain sympathies from both directions here in terms, but it's not our job, and I, I don't want to step on the toes of the PAC either. Uh, but I just understand that uh, the nature of it sometimes can be very bruising, and people who set out with good intentions to, to do good work, uh, quite rightly at times, can be very defensive of, of, of their previous work. But can I just draw your attention to paragraph 15? There's an awful interference. Somebody maybe wants to mute. Yeah, I think there, there may well be people on the line that haven't muted, but also because we've lost a um, picture on one of the witnesses, it boosts his sound, ah. the way the, the band thing works. Uh, if, if it's possible just for people to mute, because there's an awful feedback coming into the room. Uh, can I just draw your attention to paragraph 15 of the papers that were supplied to the committee? Uh, and halfway down that paragraph, it says, at no point... Did the narrow support increase to be more generous than Great Britain? It then goes on to outline a number of factors, but then it says the accurate position is therefore that support for small scale onshore wind in Great Britain was more generous than in Northern Ireland for four years from 2010 11 to 13 14, with the narrow then more generous from 14 15 for two years until closure. End of quote. Is that a play on words? Because it appears, and I'm asking for an explanation because I don't fully understand what, what point you're trying to make, it appears that Britain cut its support and ours remained the same. So the opening line is at no point did the narrow supporting increase. That's factually correct. 
but it was more generous for several years. And why was that the case? Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the factual position is the rate was set at four rocks in 2010 and maintained until closure in 2016. And you're absolutely right then. At the, for four years, Great Britain was more generous. And then for the last two years, Great Britain would have been had a, had a lower level of support available. So I think, I think what's important is to understand why the level of rocks would have been maintained at four rocks in Northern Ireland. So the rates were set in 2010. And as I mentioned, that was based on evidence carried out um, across the UK on technology costs. So there was a, a small-scale bonding review that happened in 2014 on technology costs and how they had changed from 2010. And that gathered the evidence then that, 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 that helped to inform the department's rock levels uh, at that time. What that found was that costs for onshore, onshore wind, small-scale onshore wind, had increased um, by 17% actually within this band. And, and the work that was carried out actually recommended that rock levels were increased in 2014 to reflect the incre increased costs for small-scale renewables, small-scale wind, sorry. So DEDI didn't do a steady maintain for the existing level at that time, but when they would have been looking at it in 2014, the evidence that would have been there would have been saying costs are increasing, you may need to consider increasing your support. They didn't, they maintained it at the same, le same level, and then the scheme closed in 2016. Uh, Richard, uh, I'm sorry, the sound isn't great here uh, for me anyway, but I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll try to interpret what you're saying to me. So the costs were greater here than they were in Britain. Is that what you're saying to me? Sorry, no, what I'm not doing, what I'm trying to say is that when, when, uh, when Daddy at the time would have been looking at rock levels in Northern Ireland, they would have been looking at the costs that, 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 that generators face in Northern Ireland. What they would have found from the evidence that was gathered in 2014 from the work that was carried out was that costs in Northern Ireland for small-scale onshore wind had increased from 2010. And actually, the recommendations from the consultants who did the work was to increase flux in 2014 because of the cost increase in Northern Ireland. Then he didn't do this at the time, and it maintained it at the same level. Okay, thank you. Well, tell me this. Why did Britain reduce... Their, their subsidy, it appears from this paragraph that they reduced their subsidy. Uh, uh, why did they, um, that's maybe an unfair question to you because you're not in that department, rather than department, do you understand why they cut their subsidy? Again, it's, it's very difficult um, for us to sort of uh, get into the minds of, of what happened in Great Britain. What, what I would say is I know that there was work, uh, that there was a consultation at the time in Great Britain and they decided they would add in automatic regressions within the feed-in tariff based on deployment. So where Northern Ireland focused on technology costs and what had happened and changed since then, Great Britain decided that when it met targets of, of technology deployment, that the rates would automatically decrease. Um, Trevor, do, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just, just to say, uh, you know, that's a... It's a different scheme in, uh, in GB, so I suppose you're not comparing, you know, exactly like with like. As Thomas said, it was a, a different scheme, and they had uh, they had regression based on sort of uh, uh, capacity levels, uh, so it wasn't the same. But I suppose also uh, the uh, costs in Northern Ireland aren't necessarily the same as the are in GB, and so uh, the uh, the level of support that we have had in Northern Ireland throughout the life of the NARDO has been based on the costs within Northern Ireland. So whereas, you know, we, we, we try and keep them, you know, within, you know, scope of what they have in GB, they don't necessarily have to be exactly the same. Uh, so they, but, but they were based on costs. Okay, and just then, are you, as a department, satisfied that the decisions taken in 2014 uh, to maintain the narrow at its level was the correct decision, even with the benefit of hindsight? <laughs> Based on the evidence available that, that, I, that I've looked back on, yes. Well, that's a definitive and I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and, 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 and you know, just just to put make a more wider point, John, um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, the, the audit office report tends to look at the costs, you know, as a, as a negative thing. Um, there's actually a very positive story here in that we continued to build the capacity until uh, of wind uh, and solar until the scheme closed in March 17. Um, we we have all the energy suppliers across the UK had an obligation to actually deliver renewable electricity. That's the market mechanism. It was the rocks. The rocks are traded each year that are produced. They're traded um, in the market in order for the suppliers to make their obligation. 
A good decision that was taken back in 2005 when we created our scheme and when the, when the UK government as a whole looked at the obligation was that because of the lower incomes in Northern Ireland, electricity suppliers here would have a lower obligation. So relatively, we pay less and the audit office report does draw that out and it kind of looks at it as a, a negative thing, but we would actually tend to see that as a positive thing that consumers here pay less because generally we have lower, lower incomes because of the prevalence of fuel poverty. But because we have a lot of wind, uh, too much at times, um, we, in terms of the weather, yeah, because we have plenty of wind, we're, we're now actually able to export those rocks. So in other words, that's the 191 million pounds a year figure that Thomas mentioned earlier. That is income that comes into our local economy through the, the, the wind turbines through the solar panels that then circulates in our economy. That's, that is a, a really good export. And it, it reflects the fact that we are windier here and indeed Scotland has the same situation than they are in England. And therefore we have something to export that is of value. And that's why the scheme did work so well. And that's the kind of lessons that we need to take forward as we go further towards the targets of at least 70% renewable electricity by 2030. Okay, well, look, I'll end on this point. Uh, I, I'm not looking to create more hot air. I'm looking to shed light. <laughs> on, on, on my view, even when I was on the PAC, was this. Uh, was value for money achieved at the time? And was proper governance arrangements in place at the time? Uh, and that, that's the way I would approach these matters. There's always lessons to be learned from every scheme and every policy you roll out. And all these things evolve. But uh, the, the, the core function... Uh, for me, always was was there value for money, and was proper governance in place at the time. And the PAC has obviously further work to do in that regard. And thanks, John. And is it just in relation to the the review, the 2014 review, and um, the keeping the rocks, despite the fact that um, it was recommended potentially to uh, to uplift? Um, what was the uptick in terms of the the technologies at that time? So we, uh, I suppose it's worth saying that, that the projects take many years um, to come into to place. They, they, they don't just sort of spring up overnight. So we would have had uh, uptake. Um, so we would have started to see uptake of biogas at that stage, um, and we would have started to see good uptake of, of small scale wind um, at that time as well. Um, obviously, after that ban review, then small scale wind closed two years later and eighty three years later. So. Um, there was there was quite a bit of deployment during that period of projects that would have naturally been taken forward over a number of years we had thought forward before closure. Um, Trevor, do you want to say, say anything about uh, uptake and closure around that stage? Well, other than uh, I suppose, yeah, the, uh, the the level stayed the same from 2014 is, is, is true until closure. Uh, but I suppose it's 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 not unusual, you know, that any scheme that has come to close that there's going to be a a sort of a a rush if you want to to be accredited before it actually closes but as i say in the case of the narrow that wasn't brought forward simply because it was closing uh closure of the narrow was actually announced in may 2012 you know so people had uh you know uh, at least five years uh to actually uh, develop the projects and to become accredited uh, over and above that uh, we also uh, introduced grace periods uh, similar to what they've done in GB to ensure that there wasn't a, a cliff edge and that those projects who had already uh, committed uh, uh, significant amounts of money didn't lose that money and Northern Ireland didn't lose didn't lose that capacity. And so uh, we, we, we done everything that we could to ensure that those projects that were coming forward actually did come forward and actually were a credit under the narrow and uh, were able to contribute towards our overall 40% target. And sure, if I could just add that, that our engagement um, with the, the, the industry would also, in, would also demonstrate that there are a lot of projects that never made it to, uh, to the scheme. And as Thomas mentioned earlier, it, you know, we have had no support for three years and we've got, you know, we're gonna have ambitious targets to continue the growth of renewable, not just for electricity, but across all energy vectors. Um, you know, hopefully some of these schemes can come out of, you know, they've been moth mothballed, but one of the, you know, there was an awful lot of money spent in development of projects that never, that never got commissioned. 
And so, you know, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar, they will be fundamentally important for us going forward over the next years and decades. Thanks for that. Um, Sinead? Can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and thank you for your presentation this morning. I suppose the crux of the matter is we need to have confidence in the department's ability to uh, deliver these schemes. And uh, and I believe that an awful lot of good has happened um, through the, the, the NIRO uh, and a lot of benefits. But um, it, we also supplied a very perverse incentive to adopt a very inefficient really small turbines uh, enabled installations to avoid paying rates some were not even uh, had planning permission yet were paid through narrow um, and when some installations were paid to produce energy it did not actually go into the grid and i just find that very very strange why we'd be paying for something that is actually not producing energy into the grid uh, and I just would want you to explain that. And then the other, uh, the other issue is Richard. Um, you mentioned a couple of times about lack of investment for the last three years. Um, can you can you maybe give us a little bit more information on that? You know, energy uh, and renewables is going to be one of the key drivers um, for our economy going forward, and we really need to have confidence and transparency on the department's ability to grow this sector and to deliver um, for the economy and, and, and for the renewable industry um, that is in Northern Ireland. And we need investment and a lot of investment in R&D as well. So um, if, if we are going to build a green new economy and have a green recovery, um, it's very important that all of us have confidence in your division and in your department to be able to deliver these major, major schemes going forward, and also to ensure that the energy strategy um, that, that has been proposed uh, to, to, to um, be published, hopefully, uh, towards the end of next year, is, uh, is deliverable, and, and that we have the expertise and the capability within the department to do that. Uh, a lot rights in it. And at the minute, you know, our confidence has been a bit shattered as a result of RHI uh, 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 and, some, um, and, and some parts of this audit report is not comfortable either. Thomas, if you, if you can pick up the, the initial part of Sinead's question and then maybe I'll come back about the investment piece. Okay, yeah. yes. So in the context of the narrow generators only get rocks, the, the certificates which they then sell into the market if they generate electricity. So they will not get rocks if they do not generate electricity. Um, within the single electricity market, the wholesale market, there are arrangements in place um, for generators who can't, who can't get onto the grid, who can't get onto this system in the market because of grid reasons. And this is an issue for us here in Northern Ireland, dispatch down, and because of the success we've had in producing renewable electricity, we now have more than can actually get on our grid. And, and uh, that sort of, I guess that suggests that we need to invest in our grid more going forward to help meet that future target that our minister has discussed. Um, there is also a real opportunity there from this renewable generation. As I mentioned in my introduction, the fact that we have this asset, the fact that we now have this renewable electricity, and indeed more renewable electricity that can get on our grid, means that we can start to look to use this electricity for things, for example, hydrogen production, and starting to decarbonize transport and, and heating as well. So. The narrows brought forward this asset that we can use. It's actually brought forward more than we can use at the moment because of our grid. We will need to invest further, but we have a lot of opportunity uh, across the various energy system um, to use what we've got now. Richard, do you want to say a few words on the broader piece? Yeah, before I do, just to build on what you said there, I mean, we now can take 65% of renewables on the electricity system at any one time. I mean, if you go back we go back 10 years, that, that would have been unthinkable. So we are leading the way in engineering solutions and there's an expectation that that figure will rise to 75% uh, by the end of this year. Um, so we, we, the opportunity that that the NARO has given us um, has actually be to become the market leader in many things. And, and that includes, as Tom says, you know, looking at electrolysis because it effectively having that type of demand and having battery storage as well, you know, we, we are we are able to, to to explore these opportunities locally 
and quickly with, with um, the flexibility that we have. Um, and, and just to be clear, uh, NARO is not like RHI. Um, I mean, yes, the audit office investigation started after uh, some claims that were made in a, in a, in a Radio 4 uh, program. Um, you know, for example, the headline claim was that there were phantom uh, anaerobic digestion plants, and, and the investigation proved that there were that there wasn't that that was unfounded. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, it it's good, and, and, uh, and actually, as John said before, we, we will we will do we will take a lot of analysis, not just from the department, but also from the industry to to the PAC to that and to show whether you know this scheme has value for money, and we're confident that it that it, it is value for money. Um, our concern, you are absolutely right. Our concern is that, you know, in, in the Republic of Ireland, they have the renewable electricity support scheme um, that is supporting investment. They've got well developed offshore wind proposal proposals, and in in GB, they've got the CFDs. We didn't join the CFD. We uh, we have had no support uh, for the past three years since narrow closed, and that's not acceptable. And what we find is that there are one or two investments what you would call merchant investments come to the market without the support but generally uh, there there are no the, the the amount of new capacity is much is very very low and so clearly there's a need for a support scheme as, as thomas mentioned earlier um the nature of the support is different now it's not like the narrow it's not like the fit that applied in gb it's actually to provide financial stability so it's like just to ensure that if the market doesn't deliver well then then consumers take take that element of risk so that the, the investments can can happen. Um, something finally to say is that there there is no silver bullet in getting ourselves to net zero carbon by 2050. There's going to be a lot of different things that have to work. And actually, the investment in small scale wind and in uh, anaerobic digestion in the rural economy is it something to be really welcomed. And I'm really glad we did it. And we'll continue to have to do it because it's as as we said earlier, it's not just about really large wind farm investment, it's also about smaller investments that help create the sustainable farm, for example. Um, we also need to get out of the blocks again on offshore wind. Um, you know, we are, you know, there were, there was an offshore wind or a couple of offshore wind projects in development uh, the best part of 10 years ago, and they, they, all, they all got mothballed. We do, we do need offshore wind in the future, and it, it'll take at least 10 years. So the energy strategy will, will, will obviously have something significant to say about how we develop and support uh, offshore. Uh, because, there, you know, again, what we said before, we're already seeing the benefit of being able to produce an awful lot of wind and export that. We're actually exporting energy rather than, rather than importing fossil fuels in the area of, of, of electricity. Hope that helps. Uh, thank you, Richard. It does help. And I think, uh, as I said, energy is a um, very cross-cutting, uh, cross-government theme. And possibly, I, I would go back to what Stuart said earlier, you know, under the consideration, should there be a standalone uh, department where we are fighting for that investment? Um, and if we are to be the true leaders of renewable energies, goodness knows we uh, don't have many natural resources, but we have plenty of wind, uh, and that you know, uh, and tidal uh, wind as well. And this is the time that we should be actually trying to get a way ahead of, of our other competitors uh, and be the real leaders in this particular uh, sector. And maybe, um, but you know, just because we are working with infrastructure, agriculture, and all of the departments, and how important it is. Um, you know, green energy, new day, maybe it should be uh, taken out and stand alone so that you can fight for the investment um, within, within the overall uh, government picture. I think it's something that we really need to consider because I do think that we have a great future in it, um, but it has to be really well managed uh, and delivered um, as quickly as possible. Yeah, it's something that naturally you expect me to say it is being considered as part of the development of the energy strategy. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, everyone, for their contribution. Is it the fact that we have um, so many uh, family-owned farms, etc., in Northern Ireland, uh, an issue in relation to the number of small-scale wind, wind turbines? 
I understand the report highlighted that fact that we have a lot more uh, proportionately in Northern Ireland than there is in the rest of the UK, where farms obviously would tend to be uh, uh, larger uh, enterprises. Uh, and, and I suppose the, the wind farms are uh, larger uh, proportionately. But um, the aerobic digesters have been mentioned. Um, there's, and we are very much aware of the issue uh, has been in the public domain recently. Um, planning permission. What's your understanding, Richard, in relation to planning permission? Uh, for farm dwellings, basically, uh, the first building has to, requires planning permission on, on, on a greenfield site. After that, I believe it's not required unless it's within a certain distance from, from a road. Do, did uh, or, or still do aerobic digesters require planning permission? So, so I'll come in and then if, if maybe Trevor wants to add anything to it. Um, I think on, on the small scale wind point, the nature of the, uh, the, the, the projects that have come forward, they reflect the size and scales of the farms that we have. And so that's just a natural result of the characteristics of having smaller farms and more of them in yeah. Northern Ireland. Um, I think in terms of the... the that, that was a factor. The that, that was yeah. A factor. So, yeah. Sorry, sorry, but yeah, so it's a characteristic really of, of, of the base that we have to generate wind um, and obviously being a smaller economy on smaller farms. I think when we look at the, the biogas side of things, which is produced from anaerobic digestion, for, for, an, for, for uh, an economy like Northern Ireland, which has a large agriculture sector and a rural economy, um, it's a very appropriate technology. And when we look internationally, we see other countries such as Germany and Sweden that have large agricultural sectors trying to use that as an asset to produce biogas and decarbonize their energy system. Um, I think on the planning and waste management side, this, this I suppose the question you've asked, I'm not sure any of us can answer because the Department for the Economy isn't responsible for planning and, and the experts and the planning side sit within the Department for Infrastructure and within the District Council. So we can't answer that direct question you've asked what's in terms of what needs. What's your understanding? At the end of the day, you're responsible for are you aware responsible for the, the, the rocks and the, and the approval of that? Surely you would have some awareness of whether planning permission is required or not? So within the context of the renewables obligations, um, the legislation on planning and environmental matters was consistent across all of the UK renewables obligations, um, so which, which didn't have an aspect in it to do with planning and uh, environmental issues. So planning, for example, the Audit Office report recognises that the primary responsibilities for planning sits with those bodies tasked with doing it. And the narrow legislation, no matter how it's set up, doesn't remove the responsibility on those developers to obtain the planning permission. Um, DFE doesn't have any legislative power for planning. Ofgem, who administer the scheme, doesn't have the authority or expertise to assess or enforce compliance. There already are bodies set up to do that. So again, when it comes to planning and what needs planning and doesn't, I, I, I can't provide the direct answer to that question. As part I, I would say, sorry, Gordon, I would say that it is one of the lessons for the future in setting up any further support schemes, talking about confidence, that um, we address it in the round. And that's why it's so important that we're working collaboratively across government and development of the new energy strategy. It means that DFI and DERA and DFC and DOF, they're all in at ground level when we're when we're, we're deciding on the right way forward. And so hopefully that will be tackled in the future. One, one other point I would make on, on anaerobic digestion and, and bearing in mind the narrow accredited the generating sets, not, not actually the AD plants that produce the biogas, but, but nonetheless, the, the, audit, the audit office kind of makes a negative point about the number of AD plants in Northern Ireland compared to GB. It is, it is not really a surprise. I mean, we, we, in engaging with the AD sector, after the publication of the report, I mean, they, they pointed out and very rightly that the number of ruminants, cattle mainly in, 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 in Northern Ireland is 23 per square kilometre, and that compares to nine per square kilometre in, in, in England. It means that we have a, a greater opportunity here because actually the use of anaerobic digestion deals with the waste and the, and, and the AD sector can be part of the solution. So for example, the di digested that's left behind after the biogas is then is used use usefully as an, as an energy source. The ammonia can then be treated properly and taken proper care of. So it's, you know, the AD sector is part of the solution and that's 
And that's a very popular thing. Okay. The, the report highlighted the fact uh, in paragraph 19 of the uh, information given a small scale banding review was carried out in 2014, which found that the costs of AD were largely unchanged from 2010, and therefore rocks levels remained the same until the closure of 2017. During this review, the support available for solar PV was reduced. As on Lake for AD, evidence did not show that costs had fallen. So was there a case there that you should have, have been reviewing uh, the costs and reducing the, the tariff? Thomas, you want me to take that? Uh, I, think, I think as regards, uh, as regards wind, the, uh, the cost very clearly showed I guess Thomas said earlier that the cost had actually increased, uh, and so the, but the department decided to keep the rocks as four. Uh, as regards uh, to PV, you mentioned there, Gordon, uh, the cost with PV uh, had decreased, and so therefore we uh, decided to uh, to reduce the rock levels for PV on a sliding scale from four rocks to three rocks to two rocks. So it was both, and both, uh, both technologies were both uh, based on the information that was available during the bombing review. And I, and I think, uh, Gordon, just to finish on, on what Trevor said, I mean, the main reason for the reduction in cost in solar was that there were, was the cost of the solar panels. There yeah, was a, yeah, there was a yeah. massive drop um, and, and we rightfully reflected that in the value, the amount of support that was made available. Is that not the case for wind turbines as well, though? The cost of... The no, the cost no, of, of manufacture of wind turbines has reduced significantly because uh, of yeah, the available, available throughout Europe, etc. Is that not the case? So, so what I will say is we're talking about back in 2014 and what the cost would have been then and the evidence on the cost, which isn't just the wind turbine themselves, but it's everything else that goes around it, including the planning, the development and the grid connection costs. The evidence suggested the cost had actually increased for small scale wind and hadn't changed substantially for underwood vegetation. So, I, when I look back and see the decisions made, it followed the evidence, and that's why the decisions were maintained, were, were, were made to maintain the rates. Okay. The, um, I suppose the point has been well made about lessons learned. I think the important lesson is, you know, to when you to go to develop a project. First of all, to have proper project management in place, and it's something that has been lacking, I think, within the department and across many sectors within the civil service that we have certainly seen since soon been members of the of this assembly. Uh, so that's important, but also the review and re evaluation. You know, time and time again, there seems to be lack of re review and evaluation of, of processes and procedures, and and looking on an ongoing basis about effectiveness, efficiency, quality and value for money. Can you give us an assurance, Richard, going forward that, that will, all those good <laughs> principles will be in place and that you will have the staff already has been mentioned? We understand from um, the quarterly uh, re budget review in October it was mentioned about the issue of staff and it was flagged up that you were having difficulty recruiting people. Now, I think you give us evidence today that there, there has been considerable interest in filling those posts. So I think we we hope and we trust that you know we are all clear that there needs to be a step up in in, in the uh, ability and the skills and the competence of people within the economy department. I think where everyone's clear on that. The, the lessons are there. The evidence is there. Time and time we've seen this, and we do not want to see any recurrence in relation to future projects. We wanted a robust, strong organisation that works and is efficient, is accountable, it's clear. And if it's not, I think it's important that people like yourself and other senior people flag up early that there are difficulties. Whether those difficulties are about man management or whether they're about lack of resources, lack of funding, or other issues, as they're flagged up early. Something can be done before the media, the media run with, with the story. Yeah, um, Gordon, I agree absolutely with what you say about governance and, and about project management. Um, that's why when we um, set up the energy strategy uh, project, the development of the new energy strategy, um, 
uh, two years ago. It's been run on best project management principles. We've established the project board. We've established uh, really good governance around it, and, and we hope it's been run and developed really well, and that is lessons learned from the past. We have a program management office embedded in Energy Group, and we also have very strong governance at the set center of the department um, in, in, in corporate governance. So yes, we, we, we believe we are learning from the lessons of the past, and we, we look to develop, we absolutely agree, we, we have to develop a credibility to be able to take forward what is a massive revolutionary challenge to get the net zero carbon by, by 2050. And it's not just for the economy department, but it's for government as a whole. It will change the way a lot of how we live our lives. And you're absolutely right, it, it, we have to get it right. And so we're, we've, we, we've established good core processes in this project and across the department and we're resourcing up accordingly and getting the right skills in. So yeah. I hope that helps. Yes. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, can we bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, a, a lot has been covered. I think the, the discussion has certainly been very useful. Um, I think it is important to recognise that the, the audit report does, as other members have said, highlight a number of uh, positive impacts uh, that has been had, uh, and I think that it is uh, a great achievement to get from a point of, of 3% uh, electricity consumption from renewables right up to a 40% target. So I think that that uh, is important, uh, it's important that we recognise uh, that fact as well. Uh, I, I think that we should also uh, bear in mind that uh, th there's a number of recommendations within the report which absolutely should be followed up and, and it is important that with all of these schemes um, that we, we learn the lessons because we know from the past that um, uh, you know, people uh, need to take on board where, where um, the lessons are to be learned so I think that that's important. Uh, like other colleagues and, and like the Minister and the Department, uh, we have received uh, correspondence from those within the industries who are uh, concerned, uh, they, they welcome elements of the report, but they're concerned and, and disappointed by, by some of the, the points made within the audit report and, and, and concerned that it doesn't actually reflect uh, some of the reality of the projects uh, on the ground. And, and one of them, the Renewable NIE, have actually indicated they're, they're going to be lodging a formal complaint. And I think that's a matter for them uh, to do that and to, to challenge where they feel that that's appropriate. Has the department a, a view on what we are hearing from those industries at this moment in time. I appreciate that the letters have only went in, um, in, in the past number of days, but have you viewed at this moment in, uh, in time in terms of the concerns that have been raised from the industry in terms of that report? Thomas, do you want to pick that up initially, please? Yes, of course. Um, I think it's very important that if we're having a conversation around the renewable generation we've had, that we involve the renewable generators to make sure that it reflects what has actually happened and what life, what life has been like on the ground. And I think that's why they have a vital contribution to make in, in the conversation around off the back of the Audit Office report. Um, I think if they're raising concerns about the accuracy and how, how much what's in the report reflects real life, it, it's, 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 it's an opportunity for them, I guess, to put forward the evidence and to put forward their position as well. And I think they, they have a real role to play in helping to take forward at least one of the recommendations that are in the report. So we welcome the inputs from the sector and, and we welcome further evidence um, to, to help sort of clarify some of the facts and, and the real life position. And, and just one other point, I mean, uh, as John said earlier, the nature of these reports are they, they are challenging and they are to point out what they feel as being failures. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, you can look at this through both ends of the telescope. I think there's an awful lot more positives about the narrow than there were exposed as potential difficulties in the report. And it'll be up for the industry to, to do what they feel fit, because, it, again, it's not just about confidence in the department, but it's the confidence of the industry in, in rising to the challenges of the future. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, another point that I'm just uh, on a different topic is just in terms of clarification. Uh, in your report to us, um, it's point 14, you've stated that um, there have been periods where the financial support from the IRO for 
the specific uh, technologies have been uh, both higher and lower uh, than the comparable support available in GB. And then you refer to the comparison will therefore depend on the time period chosen. Can I just get clarification in terms of what exactly you mean there in terms of uh, time period? And are there, are there any particular time periods that would stand out that we would say, you know, there's a particular problem in terms of Northern Ireland being maybe significantly higher than that in GB? <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I suppose it's worth saying that the narrow ran for 13, well, 12 years, I guess, up until 2017. Um, it's a long period of time. It covered a range of technologies and the cost position would have changed for a number of technologies during that. In addition, there were uh, two different support schemes in place in Great Britain working alongside each other, providing support for, for the same technologies. Um, so I suppose the point being made is that it depends when you look in terms of a relative position. And I think what the important thing is when looking back is to understand why the department would have made the decisions it made around rock levels. And what I can say then is whenever the key decision points around, for example, 2010 in terms of setting support or 2014 and reviewing them, is that the department followed the evidence that was there to try and reflect the costs that were in place for those technologies and um, the revenue streams that generators need. And, and so I think that's probably important to do. And I think it is worth saying that, that in energy strategy, as we look forward and look to the future and develop new policies, the focus is on how we do this in the most cost effective way. Because we're talking today about, about renewable electricity and that power 17% of our energy mix, we need to decarbonize 100% of it um, to get to net zero. And so you know, we'll need to look at the most cost effective ways to do that. And, and it will be much wider than just the conversation we're having today on that front. Thomas, I just uh, very quickly, Gary. Sorry, uh, I think it's important to note as well that the uh, around eighty five percent of the uh, uh, generation in Northern Ireland comes from large scale wind, and the actual support levels for large scale wind, so eighty five percent, has been consistently the same across the whole of the UK uh, throughout the period of the narrow. Well, thanks for that, and I welcome that um, contribution. I think that as, as a committee, it is important that we get all sides of the argument that we hear from the department, that we hear absolutely from the auditors and the report, but I think it is important that we too hear uh, from the, the industry itself and, and the reality of what's going on on the ground, and, and uh, I, I think that uh, we need to do more work there. Uh, just a final point, and it, and it has been covered by a lot of members, but it is so important given the climate that we're in and the fact that you know, there is a nervousness uh, within the general public around uh, schemes, around ensuring value for money. We know that within the, the Northern Ireland Assembly at this moment in time, there's a huge push for new targets, new strategies, um, climate acts, uh, green recovery. Can you give assurances today around that piece of ensuring that we are driving towards reaching targets, but that we're going to do all that we can to ensure um, value for money as well? Uh, just if I just pick that up, an easy answer to that is, of course, yes. And, and, a, and a small illustration is the, the demonstrator project that that is hopefully landing uh, this year before Christmas at NI Waters wastewater treatment plants. And the example here around value for money is this is to demonstrate that an electrolyzer that can use wind that would otherwise be switched off that can produce hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen is going to be used to in, in, improve the efficiency to test. It can improve the efficiency of the wastewater treatment plant and at the same time reduce the electricity costs. And NI Water spend £3 million pounds a year on electricity. They're the largest electricity consumer in, in Northern Ireland. So there's a valuable the wind that would otherwise be switched off has been used to produce oxygen that can expand the capacity of our very constrained wastewater treatment plants. At the same time, we're producing hydrogen. And that hydrogen, we, you know, the hydrogen economy is in its infancy. It can be used to, to fuel buses, for example. So we can look at that hydrogen that's been produced from wind that would otherwise be switched off to run our run our buses. And we have a an excellent uh, manufacturing plant in Balamina that has really good hydrogen IP. So there's really, you can see here why energy is joining up across government, but all the time the focus is on value for money. You know, what does that electrolyzer cost and how much is the cost of production and what is the value of what's produced at the end of it? And then we can determine what support is needed as we go in the most cost-effective way. 
No, thanks for that, Richard. I think there's really exciting opportunities going forward as well, as you've said, um, and the potential as well for, for job creation, the real boost to the economy. So, no, thanks for that. And, and thanks, Chair. And I would appreciate if we could take up about maybe how we get more uh, feedback from the industries themselves as well. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. And if, can I just pick up on um, a couple of points that were made there um, in relation to what Trevor said about, you know, the 85% coming from large scale wind um, and Gary's point around the, you know, the, the overall picture. The recommendation six in the, the audit office report is a review of all types of, of renewable generators um, around rates of return to ensure they're compatible with what was projected and, and state aid. Is that something that the department is intending to, to conduct or has already begun? Um, and I know Richard, you mentioned, I think it was yourself, Richard, mentioned um, the, the allegations around phantom plants um, and that that wasn't um, borne out within the report, but there was um, nine, I think, stations that continue to be under um, investigation by Ofgem. Has there been any additional update in relation to that? Um, and going forward, just in that discussion around um, off-grid generation um, and recommendation number two, which um, refers to the permitted use of, of electricity, is that something that potentially may not be considered in terms of future schemes or is it a case of very tightly um, de defining what the permitted use will be? Yeah, if I might be up just very quickly and I'll come to maybe let Thomas pick up on the investigation, the ongoing investigation as part of running the scheme. Um, yes, we will be looking at the rates of return. It will be part of our, I'm sure, our discussions with the with the, the PAC. We're also expecting the industry to come forward with their uh, their in independent work on rates of return, and that will hopefully be very helpful to to properly inform the debate, with both the wind sector and the anaerobic digest digestion se sector as well. Thomas, maybe you want to pick up about the ongoing, if you like, compliance activity in running the scheme? Yeah, yes, of course. Um, obviously, the scheme is delivered by, by Ofgem on behalf of the utility regulator. Um, what I would say is in relation to some of those claims that were made around, around the analog with digesters at the time, as Richard highlighted, the claim around phantom plants was found not to be true. Um, there was a further piece of work done around uh, eight different sites which had two biogas generating stations in close proximity to make sure that they were accredited correctly as two separate stations. This find uh, from, from bits on the ground, from other activity of people actually going out investigating those sites, that uh, all bar one of those sites uh, was, cor was correctly classified. And then the final two stations were reclassified as one and, and the rock levels reduced. So I think the important thing is here that one, any, so with any claims around issues to do with this are very limited. I think two, that they've been fully investigated and three, that actions being taken were appropriate. Trevor, do you want to say anything additional to that? No, I think I think you've you've covered it quite well, uh, Thomas. Uh, the, the only other thing is that you know off jam will will ensure that there's been no over oversupply of rocks, and they'll uh, they'll either you know claw them back, uh, or do whatever they is within their power to ensure that there's actually no actual uh, loss in terms of, of rocks and therefore income. Thanks for that. And just in relation to the the permitted use of electricity in the in the future, is there any view around that? Whether off grid is something that potentially will continue to be considered, um, and you know, if I think about you know micro generation and, and community energy projects, um, yeah. how we kind of define those in terms of regulation. The answer would be the answer would be yes, um, but but again, you know, historically, you know, part of the issue was the availability of grid connection. Um, so you know. It, there, there is there is no generator in the world who wants to be not connected to the grid because it doesn't allow them then to export the electricity and sell their electricity so in principle it was a it was more a factor of the time rather than um, and, and as we go forward we need to we need to ensure that you know that the the issue around permitted use is handled properly of course no thanks for that and I, I do think it is important Richard to put it in into that context because I think it's well documented that there were difficulties connecting to the grids for people. Um, Claire can we bring Claire into the spotlight please? Uh, good morning everyone. Um, 
Thank you, Richard, and thank you everyone for your for your presentation so far. Um, the last time uh, the minister appeared before the committee, um, uh, we had talked about uh, the renewable energy targets exceeding in, in respect of, of uh, energy, and I had suggested to the minister that rather than anticipating the energy strategy, which is due to be published at the end of next year, that she would consider bringing a more ambitious target um, forward um, that might encourage more uh, interest and in, in investment from from very energy company so I would just be keen to hear of an update of, of her consideration and the department's consideration of that um, the, the other question is in, in and around the anaerobic digesters um, I suppose there's, there's been a lot of criticism about anaerobic digesters which I'm sure you're you're uh, familiar with um, but one of the byproducts of that is is the gas that it admits and I had met with um, a, a natural gas company not too too long ago which suggested that could anaerobic digesters be utilized for uh, natural gas, and I think that would have benefits potentially for for uh, carbon zero and and uh, the, the climate change uh, targets. And um, so I'd be, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on that, and if the department is considering that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Claire. Um, so I suppose it's worth saying that that we recognise the success we've had, and we need to keep momentum. And I think that's our challenge. We've had three years without support and we don't want to lose momentum. And so I think our minister has been very clear that rather than wait for the energy strategy to be uh, finalised, there are things that she will progress in advance of that. And that's why in September our minister made a statement that she doesn't expect any future renewable electricity target to be below 70% by 2030. So she's given a very, very clear signal to, to the outside world and to the industry about what she expects that to be. And I know that's been really well received by the industry as well. So that helps to build on the momentum that we've had in the past. Okay. I think yeah. that's really um, sorry, sorry. I just want to pick up on that point before you move on. Um, that's you. Yeah. Will it be announced? Um, are, are we going to wait until uh, the end of next year or can we expect an announcement around that target anytime soon? Yes, yeah, sure. So sorry, I lost you slightly there, Claire, for a bit. But um, as, as, as I mentioned, the minister um, has has said so she, she's she's released that statement to make that statement now, so as investors can start to plan. And I think what investors need is they need a signal as early as you can for them to start doing the prep work and the development work. And they've got that now because they know that the target they will see will not be below seventy percent. So whether it's seventy, whether it's above, they've got the signal that they needed to start developing those projects. Okay, so is that an intention or is that a confirmed target? So the target, it, so that it's an intention that the target will be no lower than seventy percent. So it could be higher, it could be seventy. Obviously, we're still going. Is it or is it an intention? I, I know you said it's an intention for a target. So is it an intention? Well, it's it's a statement that no target will be below seventy percent. So the target will not be below seventy percent. Yeah, no, I suppose what I'm looking for is um is confirmation that that is the target. I, you know, not that. What it's going to be below, um, but you know that that's fine. You maybe can. Well, I, I mean, I think to, for clarity, just to come in, Claire, um, we're at forty-eight percent at the moment. Yeah. That's slowly ticking up because it, you know there isn't that much new capacity coming on in terms of renewable generation. What we are certain of now is that our target for twenty thirty will be seventy percent from this forty-eight or higher. So it gives us it gives an investment signal to the industry that work needs to be done. Because, as we said earlier, it takes several years sometimes for these projects to, to be commissioned. So it says the industry representatives have welcomed it because they now know that the ambition is going to be for new capacity onshore as well as potential offshore capacity. So it's a clear signal that will, you know, the actual target will, will not land until the strategy lands. But it's clear what the direction of travel is and it gives some degree of investor certainty. Okay. Yeah, no, and I think that's what industry was looking for. Um, 2030, and I appreciate you said things um, take time, um, but is 2030 maybe too far away, um, or is, is that just what we're working towards? Uh, well, again, again, sorry, Thomas, I'm jumping in here again, but everybody, everybody in the UK and Ireland is focused on a 2030 target as the next sort of sensible point. So we are, we are, we are moving consistently with what others are, are doing and saying. And that's really important here on the island, because as you know, we have the island single electricity market. So it's about maintaining that level playing field. 
Yeah. No, that that's fine. As an uninformed person, and that 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 that's that's fine. I, yeah. I, and then, so far as the anaerobic digesters. Yes, indeed. So, and, and again, I think this is when we talk around the assets that we have to decarbonize in the future. I think this this is a real strength um, for us having having digesters and biogas that we can potentially use. Um, we're talking mainly about power today, which as I mentioned is 17% of our energy use. Heat's the big one, heat's 50%. That's really what we need to focus on decarbonizing if we're going to meet net zero alongside uh, transport and energy efficiency. And biogas presents a real opportunity to do that. We've got a modern uh, gas infrastructure that can take that. And yeah. That is one of the areas that are specifically being looked up by the energy strategy is how we decarbonize our gas grid and the role of biogas in doing that. Um, so there's real potential there. And what we're seeing elsewhere is they're putting in place support to bring forward that investment in biogas to put into the grid. Again, that's something that we need to consider through the energy strategy. Okay. No, that, that's really good to hear that you, you're considering it because I, I, I understood that it maybe wasn't being considered. Um, so it's it's good that, and, and hopefully that will have added benefit to the environment and, and climate change too, particularly if, if it is going to be a byproduct and, and we can utilize that in a way that will benefit everything. So no, appreciate that. So, so Claire, if I could add one more thing, just to be clear, I mean, biogas is biomethane, um, it's CH4, um, it contains carbon. But the reason why it's uh, in inverted commas not as damaging and, uh, or it's clean compared to the fossil fuel natural gas is because when we burn fossil fuels, we unlock carbon that's been buried for millions of years. But the biogas cycle is a is a is a growing cycle. So the grass grows, or the or you know a lot of what we do in Ireland is actually waste from our supermarkets. That is now instead of just being put under the ground, that has now been used to produce energy. But mm -hmm. the carbon that's released then when that biogas is burned is actually carbon that has been absorbed during the growth cycle in the previous year. So you're not upsetting the balance. It's actually a short life cycle and hence why it's acceptable as a green technology. No, thank you for the science on that. Appreciate that from government nowadays. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Claire. Um, I, oh, I think Sinead wants to back in for a follow-up question. Can we bring Sinead into the spotlight, please? Sorry, this is just a quick question. Richard, uh, can I seek just confirmation of the timeline for the publication of the energy strategy? Um, we, we have learned that it's probably due towards the end of next year, but based on the importance of the energy strategy and based on the importance of the targets, when you said, you know, uh, the targets will land when the energy strategy lands, is there any value in your department trying to pull this forward? for an earlier publication, because I really do think that um, energy is part of our recovery and we need to speed it up. Yeah, and, and I mean, this is not the first time you've challenged us with that. When we spoke um, earlier, you, you said the same, and Thomas is leading the work on our energy strategy, and as he explained, it's a really complex project and it's across, it's, it's, it, is the, it is the third revolution in it. Energy. If the first revolution was central heating, been introduced in the 60s, and the second revolution was natural gas arriving in the mid 90s, um, the third revolution is clearly net zero carbon. So it has to. We have to get it right, and you know there's a balance to be found with the speed and actually getting this complex answer correct. What we what we are going to do is we're going to put out a um, an options consultation by the end of March, and that will a provide an element of direction of travel, and b it will provide some scenarios about that, that direction of travel and I'll maybe let Thomas come into that, but that will inform the final executive that, that will go, that the, the, the final strategy that will go to the executive for, for approval because it is cross-cutting, it will be for executive approval. Thomas, is there anything else we should say? Yes, just, um, I mean, I suppose, I suppose a few things. We, we shouldn't be in a place where we, we don't do anything until the energy strategy is there. And I think that's why the department and the minister have tried to give signals and statements now to move things forward where support signals are needed. And, and that economic recovery points are a really important one. Um, the department published a medium term recovery plan back in June, and it included clean energy and clean growth as one of the key, key sectors within it. And that's a big statement of intention about our, our need to use energy to drive the economy. Our minister, as I mentioned, has made statements around both renewables targets and also hydrogen economy, and what we might do there to give that direction of travel. Um, as Richard's mentioned, we intend to publish an options consultation in March. And, and even before that, what we've tried to do is put in place monthly bulletins of updates so as people can see, we're actually looking at these issues. We're looking at the things people are... are, are um, 
and is wanting to find out more about. But it is complex, it is difficult, but our, our key approach here is really about communication and about releasing things early whenever we, we feel in a position that the evidence suggests that, rather than sitting waiting for nothing to happen for, for a year and a bit. So um, we've taken a very proactive approach at the moment, and we want to keep that going over the next year, year and a bit, until the energy strategy, final energy strategy lands. Thank you. I appreciate that uh, reply. But you do understand we are talking about an executive that actually doesn't have a program for government at the minute and how important energy will be in that program for government. And I'm hoping that we're not really sitting here thinking that we're not going to have a program for government with the energy targets for another year plus. Um, because that would be uh, time wasted, uh, and um, <laughs> and it certainly wouldn't be the intention or the the outward intention of of, of having um, energy as an urgent project within within the context of the current executive. Thanks for that, um, Sinead. Um, Richard, if I could just pick up on the point. I know there were a number of um, pieces of research that were being conducted as part of uh, the energy strategy. Are, are those um, still being undertaken or have those be begun to be completed now? Um, and also just in relation to that um, piece that, that Thomas mentioned there about the, the clean energy being con in the economic recovery strategy. Um, is there any intention of looking at the potential for incentive schemes um, between now and when you know the the um, energy strategy might be published? Thomas, I think you should probably pick up the, the bit on the research and, and incentive schemes. Oh. Yes, of course, happy to. Um, so there, there's really three main pieces of work that we're carrying out to help inform uh, the energy strategy development that, that came from issues raised in the call for evidence. So one of those is around reviewing energy strategies in place elsewhere to make sure that what we do is in line with best practice. The second one is around sustainable energy authorities, which we mentioned earlier on, and the potential benefits and role they can bring. And the third is on uh, business and industrial energy use, because business is a key part of, of our net zero ambitions, and we need to look at how we help to, to support that. In addition to those three pieces of work, there's a range of academic think pieces that we, we, we've grant funded, and uh, the authors are leading on those. And, and again, we hope those will be put into the public domain when they're ready from the authors themselves. Um, so obviously, as part of the economic recovery, we need to look to bring forward measures that will help to do that. And I think things that have been that we've done so far is, for example, in the hydrogen economy, where there's a lot of momentum happening, um, our minister and ourselves have been engaging with, with developers in that space and potential people who can move forward projects. And that's why we've seen the project that Richard mentioned around the hydrogen electrolyzer and NI water, because we've moved that forward in advance of the energy strategy, recognizing the need to do it now. I think that's why we've seen the need to uh, we need to look to renewable electricity and what the target might be so as investors can start to develop those projects now and it's also why we need to start looking at other areas as well that can have economic benefits for example energy efficiency and how we bring forward support for investments in our building stock um, for example heat production and, and transport and options to decarbonize that too so that is part of the work of the energy strategy but again um, there will be a need for mechanisms to bring forward the investments that we need and they will have real economic benefits as well no, thanks for that. And, 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 just, and just finally on an incentive schemes, we are engaging, you know, we, we've, we've opened a conversation about, you know, the CFDs and the, the res in, in, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, you know, we, we will have to be able to land that support as quickly as we can, but it needs to be done, as we mentioned earlier in this hearing, you know, it has to be done properly. It has to be done. We have to learn from the mistakes of the past and not rush something through just because it's desperately needed. Because that's how mistakes happen. Well, thanks for that, Richard um, and, and Thomas and Trevor. It has been really useful um, briefing this morning. And um, I think, as we said, we now have to hand this piece of work over to the PAC, but obviously we'll be continuing to engage with yourselves around the energy strategy going forward. So thanks again for um, coming along this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything people want to pick up on from that? Chair, if I could just ask members to agree that we share um, today's papers on the NIRO with the PAC, we um, forward those on. Um, it's usual um, procedure just so that they have seen what we have seen. That's Fine. okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. agreed.
Okay, then, so moving on to um, item number five, which is matters arising. Um, there is at page 31 of your packs a response from the Minister to the Committee in relation to support for those who have to self isolate. Um, the Minister has highlighted that in March the Department for Communities introduced a non repayable discretionary support COVID 19 grant to assist with living expenses where a person or a member of their immediate family is diagnosed with COVID-19 and is advised to self-isolate in accordance with guidance published by the Public Health Agency. Um, and I'm sure members are, are aware of that. And as the Minister highlights in here, um, the, the grant in Britain, I think, is £500, um, but the, the discretionary support grant doesn't have that limit, so it could potentially be more. Yep. And that's useful for people to be aware of. Well, I think it can also be applied for more than once, depending on the circumstances. So, a couple of cherry just for members. And I've no doubt this is something that will will cross your desk. There's a couple of useful phone numbers and email addresses at the end of the letter. There, the ministers and yes, Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, we've dealt with five point two on your chair's business. So five point three then is on page thirty five. It's the departmental response. Um, on the Economic Advisory Group terms of reference. Um, at our meeting on the 17th of June, the Minister briefed the Committee on the Economic Advisory Group. Members had agreed to ask the Department for the terms of reference and um, at the time we asked for those that hadn't been signed off. So that has now happened. Um, do members have any comments they want to make around that? Yeah. Can I make a comment? Uh, hold on, John was just indicated first, so I'll bring you in and reset. Okay. It's disappointing that there's still no indication that there'll be representation for the trade union movement on that body, or a presentation from the trade union movement to that body, which I think is deeply disappointing because it's important that their voices are heard in that. I also have concerns that there doesn't appear to be any strategy or connection to a strategy around regional disparities uh, as well. Uh, which is a matter of concern as well. So I think by such a body is a welcome idea. It's important it has the right membership and the right strategy. Go ahead, Sinead. Um, well, I'll just repeat what John said. I'm really disappointed um, that there is no uh, reference to um, regional sub-regional development. I, I, I can't believe it, actually. Um, I'm just wondering, do they not understand that there is a disparity within... Um, Northern Ireland. It's absolutely unacceptable that it wouldn't be in the terms of reference. And also, I do think that there should be consultation with trade unions within it, uh, and there should be a mechanism to, to do that. So I, I think that we need to write back uh, to the Minister and ask why um, those two areas um, are glaringly, obviously absent from um, the terms of reference. For that um, and Peter, if I could just add in relation to the key objectives, there's no um, there's no inclusion of the, the green uh, economy in the key objectives. It is mentioned in terms of how business can contribute to public policy, but obviously a green new deal was one of the commitments from New Delhi's new approach, and, and it should be key to our economic recovery. So um, I think we could just reflect that in, yep. in our response to back to the department. Okay, Chair, we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, Chair, just on, surely the, the policy applies equally across Northern Ireland. You know, I don't, I don't get it. This thing about inequality, and it's continuously raised within this committee. I don't see within my constituency that we have anything more, anything less than other constituencies have. In fact, we have been deprived in many ways of inward investment because of her close proximity to Belfast and were overshadowed by Belfast, a city that needed huge investment because of the troubles. But I, continuously this is raised, and I think we're getting a bit tired of it, about this thing about disparity of, of areas. We can see the ongoing investment in areas like Londonderry, and they need it. There's new roads going in, there's new university going in, and yet this goes on and on and on. And I think it needs to stop there, the province needs to be looked at holistically, and the policy needs to be applied equally and fairly. And I believe that's what the minister intend to do. And this is a group looking at an economic advisory group. That's what it is. It's developing a policy equally across the province, and that's the way it will be applied. Okay, 
Sorry, can I come in there, Gordon? And I appreciate that, but you know you have to realise that County Down is not the same as as Derry City uh, and and anything. We have the highest level of unemployment, the lowest wages, the lowest economic rate, the worst child poverty, uh, and and there is a difference. And we need to make sure that we address the regional imbalances. And it hasn't been done for decades. And you can't roll out something and, and say it applies equally because if it did, then Derry wouldn't be in the circumstances that it has been for decades. It hasn't been applied equally and it needs to be. And we need to make sure that we have it in all of our strategies going forward that we address sub regional imbalances. It's gone on for too long and it needs to stop and it needs to be part of the economic strategy for Northern Ireland. And it has been in the past, only it hasn't been implemented. OK. Thanks, Sinead. Um, John O'Dowd. Well, uh, Gordon represents North Down, which is the most affluent constituency in the North. perception, John, with all due respect. Well, I accept that there, there is pockets of deprivation. I, you know, I, I, I do accept that. And where those pockets of deprivation in a constituency or identified they need to be tackled. But if you look at the North as a bigger constituency, there are pockets of deprivation which need to be... And that's, sometimes that's on a constituency level. Uh, Sinead has mentioned Foyle, particularly Derry City. There's large pockets of deprivation in my own constituency. And I'm sure every member around the table yeah. will be able to identify Same. pockets of deprivation. But it is a proven st strategy that when you target that deprivation and you invest to tackle it, it pays long-term benefits. So th I think that's what we're talking about when we say that there has to be uh, a removal of the inequalities, wherever those inequalities exist. Thanks, John. Christopher. Uh, I, I agree with what Gordon has said, and <clears throat> I represent South Belfast, and uh, quite like North Down, people have a perception of South Belfast as being a very affluent constituency. It's not affluent if you live in Sandy Row. It's not affluent if you live in Donegal Pass. It's not affluent if you live in the bottom of the Woodstock Road. So, you know, this perception that exists about constituencies and indeed about the city of Belfast is simply not true. And what I would say to my colleague from Foyle is whilst the road may be going from Belfast to Londonderry, it's also going from Londonderry to Belfast. And Belfast is the economic engine that drives this entire region. And uh, Gordon's right, there has been repeated at this committee repeatedly uh, an anti-Belfast viewpoint expressed and I don't think that that's helpful, I don't think it's constructive. I'm not talking about you Stuart so you don't need to shake your head oh, yeah, but I think I that there has been there has been an anti-Belfast viewpoint expressed at this committee which I think is unfair because whether you come from South Belfast which is perceived incorrectly as being an area of great affluence. I would suspect that John's colleagues in the west of the city would dispute this idea that Belfast gets all of the opportunities in Northern Ireland. The north of the city or in the east, there is need and there is deprivation throughout Northern Ireland. Correct. And if, you're, if you represent North Down as Gordon does, people think of Coltra and places like that. Gordon also represents Kilcooley. And he represents housing estates in Bangor. So I, I do agree with Gordon. There is no deliberate governmental oversight to ignore any part of Northern Ireland and in what the Minister has sent to us. And I think it is disingenuous mm. to suggest otherwise. In terms of having the opinions of the trade unions, absolutely happy to communicate with the Minister that that, that is a voice that we should hear. I have no problem with that. But I agree with Gordon. This idea that Belfast gets everything or North Down is privileged or any other constituency is being treated uh, advantageously over another is simply not true. Okay, thanks. Uh, Gary is looking in for a point. Uh, just a very brief point. I think uh, you know, the views have been well aired. I think it is important uh, to recognise the fact that you know, absolutely, um, you know, it, it's right that MLAs can speak up for their individual constituencies, and I think that that's a fair point. But I think it's also uh, appropriate that that we do so at the relevant times. And, and you know, when we look at the likes of the Economic Advisory Group, you know, from the start there was a recognition that that was to bring together. 
uh, world leaders in terms of their fields. And I think that, you know, it's unfair actually to criticize them and say that, you know, in some way, you know, before they complete their line of work, because there's a lot of work to be done around developing a strategy um, or developing a way forward out of, out of this uh, COVID pandemic. And I think it would be unfair to suggest that they would in any way be biased, uh, because I can assure you that, you know, we know in the city, and let's be honest, nationalist parties have had the, the, the uh, domination of this city for a long, long time, and we know uh, how they've handled the situation locally. Uh, and we need to ensure that, um, you know, rather than pointing fingers at, um, you know, uh, and, and sort of trying to lay the blame on, on, on individuals, I think that political parties with the responsibility and with the majority of positions within the relevant um, the relevant uh, elected chambers, they use those in a productive way uh, to try and get results rather than simply uh, trying to point score uh, as we go forward. So that's really all I want to say in that matter at this moment in time. Thanks, Gary. Um, Claire? Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, just, just to add maybe a different perspective um, in this regional balance debate, I had a meeting with um, quite a, a big company in, in uh, Northern Ireland not so long ago, and they were talking about the impact on COVID and, and where our investment goes. And they're suggesting almost now that because more they're, they're starting to see the benefits of people working from home, they're... they're uh, suggesting that will they need the big expensive office blocks in, in Belfast or Derry or, or indeed anywhere um, because people working from conducive to family life. So if we're talking about investment in particular areas, it does have to be a completely regional um, investment um, in and around uh, broadband and all those types of things. Um, you know, so I think, you know, we, we can all... Um, uh, defend our own constituencies and you know to be fair to Sinead you know I, I was uh, asked for comment on the unemployment figures that um, exist in the northwest and that's not just Derry that's uh, my constituency too in East London Derry so Limavady and Corian and it has long been an issue uh, it's not a new Bravo, Andrew, thank you so much. It really is. We have yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> Bravo's not working well there. Like no, you hear me now? Go ahead. Come back. Can you hear any of me now? Yeah. From Lima Valley, you're calling me and all. All the matter. Well, I'll try you. I'll that. Um, look, I... I, I... I don't think any, we should be critical of anyone trying to highlight the issues. That's what our jobs are here for. Um, but I do um, agree that it, it isn't just about one particular area. It's about Northern Ireland in general. And I think we, we, we need to get back to that focus. But it, it is also looking at the other challenges that are presented. And COVID, insofar as any economic strategy, will, will, will be an interesting one moving forward. So, you know, I think we need to get a grip with what's happening now so that we're not, you know, uh, missing the, the ball on that and, and regretting it 10, 20 years later. Chair, just very briefly, I, I, equally well, it would be very unfair to suggest that there are not any sub-regional inequalities. They are, and they are widespread, and each of us, as others have said, can speak to our own constituencies in respect of that, whether it's rural parts of County Antrim and the lack of broadband uh, and all of those sorts of things, or even, as Gustav Stolford has referred to, Belfast being the economic engine uh, for the whole of Northern Ireland, but particularly the Greater Belfast area. But that draws people out of communities to work in Belfast and leaves those communities quite often um, quite often suffering as a result of becoming effectively bedroom communities rather than um, rather than economic generators in their own right. So the community is suffering because of the jobs provided in the city of Belfast because of the income that people get when they go to those jobs and because of the uh, the economic benefit that comes from working in the city of no, Belfast. That, that, that's not the point that I'm making. The point that I'm making is that, of course, that makes a ma massive contribution and allows people to live in those communities, but it also generates other difficulties in those communities. High street deprivation and all of that flows on from the fact that we have that. Going back to the point that Claire is making, how we diversify all of that, 
how we how we give the economic benefits right down into every sector of our society in Northern Ireland is where we need to be pushing. Well, th there is a reason why the population of Belfast doubles during a working day, because we have two universities, we have a young professional uh, population, we have so much that we contribute to Northern Ireland to drive Northern Ireland forward, and it has become a, a refrain, not from you, okay. it has become a refrain in this committee to bash Belfast and, and actually, I mean, Gordon's right, the Greater Belfast Conurbation, which includes North Down and it includes Lagan Valley, um, it has become a refrain in this committee, and I, I don't agree with it. And I make no apology for defending the city that I was born and reared in, <laughs> which I know drives Northern Ireland forward. If Belfast's doing well, everyone is doing well. And just as mm. if Londonderry is doing well, everyone is doing well. You can't raise one area up by constantly criticising another. Okay, well, I'm going to bring the discussion to a close, but um, thanks for everybody's contributions. Well, sorry, can, I, can I have a retort there, please? Three goals already. You're talking about the chair. Absolutely no way. Yeah. Um, and, and to say uh, otherwise is disingenuous. Yeah. I am merely stating that there is disparities. It's a fact. I'm not making it up. It's a fact. And we need to address it. And it will bring everybody up. Thank you. And if we can please direct the comments through the chair um, in future. Uh, thank you. Um, I just would like to bring the, the conversation to close. I do actually think it has been a useful discussion. Yeah. Um, I think there can't be a denial of historical regional imbalances and those do need to be addressed. And that is, by the way, a commitment and new decade new approach to do that. But I do think none of us would um, reject the idea that our economic recovery strategy has to be for the whole of the North. Um, and I think Absolutely. also that the discussion that we're having here in relation to the challenges that's faced in terms of, of Belfast as a city uh, and how it recovers from the, the COVID um, and the impact that that we have all seen and the changes to how people live and work is, is as much part of the economic recovery strategy as every other town and area across the north needing to be um, considered as part of that recovery strategy as well. Um, so I think that that is something that does need to be reflected in terms of the economic group, advisory group um, and the, um, the considerations that it has to have to how regionally the North recovers. Chair, what I'm thinking is it might be um, useful for me to bring the letter back to committee, um, but, but what, what I'm, I'm kind of taking away in terms of, of um, what will go into the letter is that the, the group needs to focus on deprivation wherever it finds it. Yes. Um, and that that should be a key focus, that should be a key objective. So I'll bring back a draft. Yes. Um, for members to look at. I'm, I was also going to flag up too, Chair, and we come to it a bit more later on. Um, the micro inquiry on the bigger economic picture um, discussion event tomorrow will raise a lot of these issues. And then what we hope to do then is next week bring that back into committee to discuss how all that can be done again. Um, so that, that discussion will come back in, and it is something that's very live. Yeah, I know. I think that, that that point about deprivation, obviously, again, from New Decade, New Approach, there's a commitment to be directing resources on the basis of, object, of objective need, and that, therefore that fits along with that objective as well. Great. I'll bring back that draft. Thank you. Okay, so moving on then to um, 5.4. Yes. There's a departmental response in regards to the impact of COVID-19 on teaching and suggestions tuition fees should be reduced. At our meeting on the 9th of September, members considered correspondence from a Queen's student. Um, members agreed to forward that to the department for comment. So um, unless anyone has any additional comments to make in relation to that, it's for noting. Okay. Okay, thank you. 5.5 .5, then, there is a de departmental response in relation to the Energy Efficiency Group. Um, at our meeting on the 9th of September, members considered correspondence from the Energy Efficiency Group NI regarding what it believes as a lack of vision in energy policy. Members had agreed to forward it to the department for comment. Um, and bear in mind, um, no, sorry, if I could ask members to bear in mind this response when we're considering our report on the energy strategy later in the meeting. Members are content? Yes. Great. Thank you. 
Page 41 then is a departmental response um, from the British Heart Foundation research in, in, on research investment. Um, at our meeting on the 1st of July, we considered the correspondence from the British Heart Foundation concerning the threat to research investment. Members that agree to forward it to the department for comment. So it's to note unless there's additional comments. No, it is right. There is a departmental response then at page 42 of our packs in relation to funding for the City of Derry Airport. Um, at our meeting on the 30th of September, members received a briefing from the department on the October monitoring round. Members had asked the department to provide clarification on timescales for funding for the City of Derry Airport and if funding will be a one-off. The department has confirmed funding until the end of the financial year. Um, if there any further comments? Sure, if, it's, if it's helpful, because of the uh, intention to do annual budgets instead of a three-year budget, those kinds of mitigations for um, regional connectivity will have to be applied on an annual basis that they can't um, fund longer than an individual financial year. So the process will have to repeat each financial year. Chair, can I say I happily endorse that and support all funding going to the City of Derry Airport just to keep the Deputy <laughs> Chair of the Committee happy. That's fine. <laughs> it has been noted, <laughs> Chair. Uh, the funding has been noted. <laughs> Thank you. Supported. Thank you very there. Yes, go ahead, Gary. Uh, you've also made your colleague um, happy as well, Christopher, uh, Here, in that respect. Uh, which, of course, is your priority, um, and rightly so. And in terms of the airports, I, 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 look, I've had some engagement recently, uh, particularly with the uh, International and um, the, own, the airport in London Derry as well. Uh, a lot of real concerns uh, about, about that industry, and I think that we would all share that. Uh, one of the main concerns is the fact that there doesn't appear to be any strategy you know, for airports in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I know that there has been some engagement uh, with um, departments on, in that respect, but it's my understanding that that needs to be brought forward uh, by the uh, infrastructure minister in collaboration with their uh, counterparts in Westminster as well. So could I make a suggestion that we uh, write to the infrastructure minister in that regard and request that, you know, is there any forward thinking or strategy in place for our airports here in Northern Ireland. It's so important in terms of connectivity uh, and we need to ensure that we have airports left, particularly west of the ban at the end of this pandemic. Second. Okay, sure, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, moving on then to 5.8, uh, page 43. There's an update and revised COVID bids from the finance director in light of the new restrictions. The committee was briefed by officials on the 14th of October on October monitoring and then on the 16th of October, the Department of Finance issued a further request asking all departments to review their COVID bids um, in view of re increased restrictions. Following a review of the COVID bids by business areas taken into account the impact of increased restrictions on deliverability, the COVID bids submitted as part of the October monitoring round were reduced by 3.6 million from 18.4 million to 14.8 million. The reduction is primarily focused on tourism bids, um, which is 3.15 million less. Um, so it's to note, unless there's any further comments. Chair, just to, to kind of expand on that, it's, it's largely down to timescale and delivery. Uh, a lot of that money had been focused on marketing campaigns that are now much more difficult and complex because of the restrictions and the close down. So the money has been reallocated just so that it's not lost. Yeah, I know, and I think it's wise, and we've all um, urged departments to reallocate funding rather than lose it. So. Noted. Thank, Thank you. you. 5.9 then, there is a page 44 of your set pack, a response from the Minister of State to the committee regarding the definition of qualifying um, NI goods, um, EU exit regulation 2020, so as to note unless there's any further comments we had asked about it. Sure, we, we, we still have multiple um, clarifications with the Department and, and with the Secretary of State, but those are dependent on conclusion of negotiations. Okay. So 5.10 we've already dealt with, 5.11, um, page 50 of your pack is from the Department for Communities um, in relation to support for those who have to self-isolate. Mm -hmm. So it's to note, unless there's any further comment. Um, 5.12, then at page 52 of your pack is correspondence from an individual about um, a comparative look at university COVID-19 positive cases here and within the, the British student population. So, have members any comments or well, happy to know. John? 
Um, the figures supplied by this, by the, in this letter seem extremely high in, in Britain compared to the cases we are having here. Uh, and I'm just wondering is it how the cases are recorded uh, rather than anything else? Can we get more information on that? I know Queen's, there was figures released in Queen's about their halls, etc. I think this is where the complication arises, Chair, is, is different universities are doing different, using different methods. Queen's has its own track and trace, uh -huh. but it also had inflated figures because um, the Chinese group of students that came in were, were put into the self-isolation group automatically because they'd come in from abroad. So it, it made Queen's numbers really high for a couple of weeks. Uh -huh. So it, it seems to be the, the, the disparity on collection. Some universities don't have a... a localised methodology. Others are finding problems and students have, have relocated back home as well. So it seems to be completely inconsistent and therefore the figures we've got are, are put together using like a patchwork of different methodologies and that's that's where I have some concerns. But yeah. what if members are content, what we can do is write directly to um, our higher education stakeholders to, to know exactly what it is they're doing and how the sorts of numbers they they are recording. Yeah, that would, that would be, I think that would then would be able to compare comparable mm. figures. Yeah. Um, and it might also be useful um, to have some indication of the further education colleges because uh, I know there were figures in school. Another thing, too, is was a factor: are these students um, working within their universities rather than working at home? But I think you know, it's a key that's... issue, Chair. Um, I know a lot of students have relocated home because they, the courses yeah. are not entirely online in some subjects. Here, I think. So it, it means that they no longer fall within the university's um, numbers of cases and so on. So it's, it's become a really complex picture because we haven't reached a point in time where everybody who's there is there for the foreseeable future and is going to classes and everybody else is at <clears> home <throat> or whatever. So, Hopefully, the universities will be able to shed some light on the time scale for that. The, the other factor to take into account as well, and this is relevant to schools, when you hear the figures for infection rates in schools, the, the question may was the infection caught as a result of school activity or activity outside the school? And it's the same as universities. Is it a result of university activity or activity outside the school yeah. or outside the university? It's, yeah, it, makes it, it just makes it much yeah. more complex to pin down mm. exactly yeah. what yeah, yeah. I got exactly it's where the risk factor is where where's the risk is it in the institution or is it outside the institution that's the relevant issue okay thank you um we've dealt with 513 and 514 already so we'll move on then to item number six which is the sl1 corporate insolvency and governance act amendment of relevant periods for meetings or registered societies and credit unions number two regulations um, Northern Ireland 2020. There's a clerk's memo at page 28 and correspondence from the Dallow at page 80. Um, the department proposes to make an SR under the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020. It's subject to confirmatory procedure and will come into operation on the 3rd of November. Um, the purpose of the SR will to be to extend the temporary corporate governance measures which were included in the Act, which tempor temporarily lifted the requirement for mutual societies to hold their meetings in physical locations until the 30th um, of September. The department has already made regulations extending this till the 30th of December and the um, enabling power in the Act allows only allows the period to be extended no more than three months at a time. So further regulations are required. This SR will extend the period until the 29th of March 2021. The Minister referred to this yesterday in yeah. her statement. Um, and I think members um, are likely content with the policy, but we'll put it out there anyway. So this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 as it's not possible to amend once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. So are members content with the policy direction? Uh, Chair, I think, uh, yes, we are, or well, certainly I am. Um, anything that we can do to allow credit unions and mutual societies to function is only to be welcomed. I suspect the exact same provisions might be brought to us sort of Christmas time, but you know, absolutely content with that. And I think the feedback that the Minister indicated yesterday was some of these mutuals and credit unions have their ADMs in January and February. Yeah. Yeah. So it is important that this is extended in light of ongoing restrictions. Great. Okay, thank you. 
Number seven then, there's a departmental briefing on EU exit legislation. Um, at page 84 of your packs, there's a written departmental briefing um, and the monitoring dashboard to provide members with an overview of the legislative programme required to be delivered by the department and its ALBs by the end of the EU exit transition period. At our meeting on the 23rd of September, the committee agreed to ask the department for regular updates on progress. The minister has stated that the dashboard is a high-level visualisation tool to track volume and progress of legislation through its key stages and highlight key blockages and risks which may stimulate requirements for more detailed briefing on individual issues. In addition, she's indicated that officials are um, at the committee's disposal in terms of such briefings. Um, so just to remind members that bringing forward the legislation listed is contingent on a variety of factors, including in some cases the conclusion of the negotiations. It's obviously now November and there is a strong likelihood that if negotiations are concluded with an agreement, legislation will come to the committee en masse. So, um, I guess there's not an awful lot more we can say in relation no. to that because I'll we don't have clarification in relation to the negotiations. If, if just but there's likely to be something over the next week or so. The, the, I know it's incredibly small print on the actual dashboard itself, but the key thing to, to look at is the, the two colours, which are primarily are a pale green or a pale red, pale red is stuff that's pending. So that's all, if things go according to plan, that's all likely to come in, in a fairly short space of weeks. Um, so just, just to flag that up, a lot of it's technical. So um, I would hope that we can work through it reasonably well, because it's, it's generally, uh, in, in, um, it's relative to what we've seen before. Um, so a lot of it's familiar. Yeah. yeah. But there'd be a lot. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> Okay, Something to look forward to. Forward to. <laughs> yes. Um, item number eight, we actually will be considering that today. It will be. A we, we've agreed with the Department of the 18th. We, we provisionally put that in quite a while back and we just hung on to it just in case. But with everything that's happening, um, CSR is back up in the air again. So we're, we're now looking at the 18th instead. Okay, so moving on to then item number nine, which is the House of Commons International Trade. Um, committee inquiry into the UK Japan trade agreement. Um, at page 95 of the pack, there's correspondence from the second clerk. Can that just take the inquiry they did into the EU trade agreement with Japan? And that would do that one. Clever. Same agreement. Clever, John. Clever. <laughs> I'm just thinking of the poor workload they have on. And I think that, that I think there has been a certain amount of cut and paste chair. Um, a certain amount? You can pay for a room with. Um, but the, the interesting um, issue with this that, that was flagged up to committee by officials was there are there appear to be goods under the UK Japan agreement that aren't part of the UK the, sorry the EU Japan agreement. So that's where the potential issue lies for us. Members will recall this from the, the briefing from the officials, and it, it got a bit of fair bit of media attention the next couple of days. So if members are content, that's that's what we have discovered to flag up, that the, the agreements don't necessarily match when it comes to the protocol. And anything that's not within the protocol in terms of goods coming here um, can't if if it's not part of the EU's agreement, but it's part of the GBA agreement. So that's where the mismatch is, and that's where the negotiations need to, to join up the dots to ensure that um, we can benefit from both. Noted. Okay, so, uh, yep. Members, members are content we do that. Through the chair. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Sinead. Through the chair, just, just on that, um, I mean, there's an awful lot more agreements um, that, that that could be transferred or that we could be able to partake in. Uh, and we see now that there is a discussion between the EU uh, and particularly the Republic of Ireland um, requesting that Northern Ireland uh, be given access to the current um, free trade agreements that exist within the, the EU. And I think that's something that we should be really, really pushing within uh, the Northern Ireland Executive, and, and, and I feel it's very, very quiet. Um, you know, now that we're at the very, very last um, round of these negotiations, we should be pushing hard to make sure that Northern Ireland um, is in that unique position where it can um, have the benefit of new agreements, uh, but also uh, have the current agreements that the EU has uh, in place so that uh, we're not at a disadvantage uh, for the rest from the rest of the island. 
Right. Chair, we've, we've already um, moved ahead on that. Um, members will recall we had a, a fair amount of discussion and collaboration with the Lords EU committee where those, those exact issues have been raised and they have then raised them in turn um, with ministers that have come to give evidence there. So they're, they're very much on record. We've also written to the executive about that. And I know um, at least the finance minister had commented in the chamber about how that's part of what the executive is trying to achieve. Essentially, the, the ideal is best of both worlds. So you, you get to um, make use of all the EU's uh, free trade agreements, but you also get to make use of all the UK ones as well. So effectively, Northern Ireland can use both. So that's the ideal, and that's really what we, we, we need to get from those negotiations. Okay. And uh, we're, we're told that that's what people are talking about. Yeah. Thank you. So moving on then to item number 10, the HSE um, annual report and accounts, page 97 of your pack. There is the report and accounts 2019-20, um, the health and safety executive for NI annual report and accounts for the year ended. The 31st of March 2020 was laid for the NI Assembly under paragraph 19.3 of Schedule 2 of the Health and Safety at Work NI Order 1978 by the Department for Economy on the 23rd of October. Um, the Comptroller and Auditor General has indicated he's content with the accounts, so it's um, to note unless members have any particular comments they want to make. Um, I am at, yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead, John. Uh, well, a significant proportion of the, the reports to the HHS uh, ENI appear to come from the public sector, uh, which in itself is a good thing that there's a, there's a there's a reporting mechanism there in place, and staff appear to see feel comfortable reporting it. My concern is the lack of reports in the private sector, uh, and uh, which would be a serious cause of concern for me. And I think in terms of the future relationship between the economy, the health service, and COVID nineteen. Uh, HS ENI is going to play a crucial role in that, in protecting uh, workers and customers, uh, for that matter, uh, in, in different venues. So there needs to be uh, an investment to ensure that we have the, enough inspectors in place, enough investment in place to allow them to do their jobs. Uh, but the, the lack of reporting from the private sector concerns me. Chair, I know the department has put in bids for additional staffing. Uh, same with the LRA as well, because there, there's a lot of um, anticipation of, of employment disputes and so on as well. Those went through in the summer exercise that there's still ongoing bids as far as I know, but we check back and see if anything has, yeah. has, has come out of that. And as members might expect, there was a lot of um, inspections in relation yeah. to COVID, um, and that work probably is going to have to continue mm. yeah. for quite some time. So I think there was... Uh, a decrease bid, but it was something to do with um, the lack of engagement activity that could yeah. be carried out. Yeah. Um, and now there is a need to have additional resources allocated. But th I think they're primarily going to focus on um, physical staff resource. Okay. I think Sinead just... Yes, Sinead, go ahead. Uh, just, I want to put on record my appreciation for uh, the HSE and I. They are working in very difficult circumstances at the moment. Uh, and, and by and large, I think um, they, they are responding very, very well. The one small criticism is that the website's very hard to navigate, and I'm sure all members have uh, have um, have seen this when they're going into to lodge complaints for many employees. So that's just one small small thing, but they have uh, really raised uh, their standards uh, in relation to this uh, pandemic. And I think we need to recognize that uh, and appreciate it. I think it might be worth getting a briefing because there is a yeah. lot of stuff going on with the HSE. And yeah, I think so yeah, yeah. if we can bring them in, because I know they have a lot of things they want to say as well. Yeah, okay. so We've had them before, Chair. Sorry. We've had them before some years uh, ago. We've had briefings. And obviously, farm safety is a big issue as well. It can be seasonal, but it's ongoing. I think we need to ensure they've got the proper resources in place. But the points were well made about the COVID issue. I know initially we had problems with call centres. Uh, the place, places were not set up properly. We had to get them in. They were looking to go in. Eventually, did, and they did monitor the situation and resolved it. But I, I think there, there are a number of issues that we would like clarification on. So I think a, a session with them would be useful, Chair. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that. Agreed. Okay, then moving on to um, item number eleven, which is correspondence. Um, 
There at page 289 is correspondence from the Minister in relation to the HSE ENI board competition consultation letter. So it's to note unless members have any comments. Noted. Um, 291 then is correspondence from the Minister in relation to REACH, etc. Amendment, etc. EU regula exit regulation 2020, the REACH SI. Um, am I saying that right? Yes, it is. It's <laughs> the minister as good as is it gets, Chair. writing to advise the committee of a request for legislative consent that Minister Poots has received for the statutory instrument for mentioned. Um, both DFE and DERA share competency for this legislation with DERA acting as policy lead. The minister has highlighted that due to the short time scales to consider this complex legislation, unfortunately, it has not been possible to engage with the committee in advance of it being laid in Parliament on the 19th of October. However, with only a short period remaining before the end of the EU exit transition period and consequent pressure on parliamentary time, the Executive has agreed that individual Ministers on a case-by-case -case basis can take decisions for draft affirmative SIs to be laid while former legislative consent is outstanding, but not debated until consent from NI Ministers has been received. This allows for the timely delivery of the remaining EU exit legislative programme while still ensuring that NI ministers and committees have the opportunity to consider and decide on consent to the policy in relation to the SI. The Scottish Government is currently operating this same model. The Minister has concerns on the effect of proposed arrangements for NI business. In addition, the Minister is concerned about the operational ability of both the Department, DERA and HSE NI to fully deliver the statutory obligations on our, under the EU chemicals regimes post-transition period. The Minister has noted car the following careful consideration that having conveyed her concerns to Minister Putz, which will be relayed to DEFRA, addressing that her consent will be subject to the receipt of assurances. So at present, unless there are any additional comments, is to note until we get further information. Noted. Okay, so moving on then to page 294. Correspondence from the Minister in relation to the Chemicals, Health and Safety and Genetically Modified Organisms Amendment of Retained EU Law, EU Exit Regulations 2020. The Minister has indicated to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions that she does not object to the laying of the SI in Parliament. However, her consent will only be provided if a number of assurances are given. So, as previous, yeah. um, until we have more information, is to note. Not really. Okay, so 11.4 then um, was dealt with under Chairperson's Business. 11.5 um, at page 300 of your packs is correspondence from the Minister regarding consent by NI Ministers to the UK statutory instruments. So, again, to note unless mm -hmm. there's further comments. Okay, 11.6 then, page 302 um, of your packs, the Government Response Report from the Department on the Priority Dispatch Consultation to the decision paper on the priority dispatch provisions of the 2019 Electricity Recast Regulation EU 2019-943. So it's to note unless there's any further comments. Jane. Just to say that will feed into the new energy strategy and it's a, a way of allowing, it's what members were talking about, the small scale generation being brought on grid, it just makes that an awful lot easier. Okay. Um, 11.7 then at page 323 of your pack, there's a clerk to clerk memo from the Committee for Infrastructure on the NIE New Home Way Leave Agreements. The committee had agreed to write to the Committee for Economy to ascertain what, if any, communication it has had with the Department for Economy in respect of issues around connections by NIE to new homes in rural areas and way leave agreement, in particular where responsibility for establishing compulsory way leave agreement lies. How many such agreements exist? What is the process and how easy is it for consumers to navigate? And how many applications for new connections are received as opposed to the number of way leave agreements? So our members can then forward those questions to the Department for response. We don't have up to date figures, Chair, so it, it makes sense to ask. Great, great. Page 324 of your pack, this correspondence from Gemma Dolan, MLA, advising the committee that she's developing a private member's bill on zero hour contracts. So um, just seek members' um, agreement to acknowledge the letter and indicate that the committee will be keen to engage regarding um, the bill should it progress. Obviously, this is something that we have previously discussed ourselves in relation to the, um, the issue and the uh, what falls within our remit in terms of the Employment Act. Members content? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
11.9 then at page 326 of the pack, uh, the report published by Renewables NI on the power of renewables, a route to 80 by 20 or by 30. A route to 80 by 30. Um, it took me a while to. So, unless there's any further comments, it's to note for now. Great, fine. Um, page 354 um, of your packs, the survey and report by NI Tourism Alliance. Um, entitled Protecting Life, Protecting Livelihoods, Finding a Balance to Protect Our Community and Our Economy. So obviously we're very aware of some of the issues that have mm. been highlighted in this and have discussed at length previously. So um, to note for now. Chair, Gary has a question regarding Sorry, five, Gary. 5.7, if I... Oh, no, I think Gary yeah. asked. Oh, was that, is it, that sorry, no, just did this come through to my phone now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. That was 25 minutes ago. 11.11 um, 11 then at page 365, there's correspondence from the Association of British Insurers in regards to fleet vehicle insurance. The correspondence indicates the vehicles are that are registered as off-road do not require insurance cover. As with all, I suppose, of our correspondence about insurance, it's a little bit frustrating, but... Um, I think if we could pass it on to, I think, was it Tony that attended? It was, yeah. We'll, um, we'll share it with our stakeholders just so that they have an idea of what's going on there. Okay, thank you. Um, 11.12 was already dealt with. 11.13 at page 367 of your pack is correspondence from Bell Coo Frack Free in regards to the internal review which provided the basis for tendered research. Um, unless members have any additional comments to make, the department is already in receipt of the correspondence and we will be copied into the response to the queries that have been raised. Great. Thank you. Page 372 of your pack, correspondence from the joint letter from the Committee of the Administration um, of Justice and other organisations to the Secretary of State and the Ministers of State in relation to citizens' rights, frontier workers, EU exit regulations 2020. Um, so members of contempt will write to CAJ indicating that the committee has a close interest in the issues that they've raised um, and would like to receive a copy of any response received by CAJ. Um, the committee may also want to write to the Home Office to put on record our concerns around or sure. have we already... We have uh, a couple of times but I'm just thinking if we see what they say back to the CAJ that'll give a more... Uh, give us more basis yeah. to write on. Yeah, I think there's a lot of concern there about the lack of consultation yeah. around this, so, yeah. Okay. Okay, moving on then to 11.5, at page 377 of your pack, uh, there's a group correspondence from an individual in regarding COVID-19 cases in universities. So it's to note, unless members have any additional Notice. comments. Same, Same correspondent, uh, yeah. the, the department has it, so they deal with an FOI. Okay, thank you. 11.16 then, um, page 386, the ISNI Delivery Tracking System Investing Activity Report. So it's to note unless members have any comments. Great. Um, AOB then, I think is there, there wasn't any because no, there's already raised. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just one wee okay. small point. P 324 from Gemma Dolan. Yeah. She, she must have moved constituencies because... <laughs> Did anyone notice I that? I spotted that, yes. You did? It has, um, did you see that? I think it's been a cut and paste because it's got Kelly Armstrong's <laughs> contact details at the bottom of the letter. <laughs> but what it has been is that's been the template that has been used because you're sent a template for all of that and they never sent the template, didn't take out that bit. I but wonder, it's gone through on the letter. That, that's really, I thought they shouldn't have got a seat at Warren Strangford. And, <laughs> Next time, right? That was where I was. Okay, so the committee's now that going was to worrying into the session. Yeah. So thank you. So don't. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.